This story occurred when I was driving back home from work one night. It was snowing like crazy and had been for quite some time. I got off work late, which was not good news for me. When I got back to my car, I had to clear off all the snow with a snow scraper. There were probably about three or four inches on top of it already. When I finally got inside my car and left, I quickly realized the driving conditions were not safe at all. It was around 10 p.m. at this point. I drove very slowly on the roads, and there seemed to be hardly anybody else out driving. It would normally take me about 15 minutes to get home. This time, though, it took almost 30. Basically, the entire way back, I really only noticed one car. It was driving right behind me. I don't even remember at what point it started to drive behind me, but I think it was pretty early on. Each time I turned, I did not expect the car to turn with me, but it did each and every time. By the time I was almost home, I assumed this must be one of my neighbors. The roads were so slippery that you had to take every turn very slow. When I turned onto my street, the car behind me did as well, at a very slow speed. I was pretty sure it must be a neighbor. There were a lot of other houses on my street, and I didn't know everyone that lived there. When I got to my driveway, I turned and pulled in. The car following me kept going down the street. I have a garage at my house, but it's detached. I drove up to it and then opened the garage. I drove inside and closed the garage door. I turned my car off and got out. After that, I got my bags from the back seat. Then I left the garage to walk back to my house. As soon as I opened the garage door though, I saw a car parked in my driveway. It was the same one that had seemingly followed me. At first, I was just really confused. I didn't know what was going on. It was in between my garage and house, and I had to walk around to the front door. When I saw that car, I stopped for a second and thought about what to do. I couldn't tell who was driving the vehicle because of it being so dark out and the headlights and all of the snow. I didn't know who it was or what they were doing here. Instead of confronting them or something, I decided not to. I chose to ignore their presence and walk right past. Looking back, it was kind of weird, but I just wanted to get inside as soon as possible. I figured they would probably just drive away once I did. Plus, it was snowing hard, and it was much safer inside. I turned and began walking along the front of my house to the door. When I was about halfway there, I heard the door to the car open. Whoever had been inside must have gotten out. I kept walking and didn't bother to turn around. When I just about made it to my front door, I finally decided to look over my shoulder. When I did, I saw a man standing there next to the car, wearing this really creepy-looking clown mask. It sent a shiver down my spine. I hurried and unlocked the door, then went inside. The man did not move at all. He just stood there. It was really creeping me out. After getting inside, I went to the other end of the house. I wanted to just ignore his presence. When I went back a few minutes later, he was gone. The car, the guy in the clown mask. I was happy to see that they were gone, but the whole situation still seemed really odd to me. Why would somebody follow me in that bad of a snowstorm? The driving conditions were terrible. Then he just stood there looking at me like a complete weirdo. It's something that still leaves me wondering to this very day. This happened back when I was a teenager. I think I was 14 years old and probably a freshman in high school. It was the winter time and sometime in the early evening. The sun had already set and it was very dark out. We were getting a large snowstorm. I was sent outside by my mom to shovel the driveway. She was cooking and said the food would be ready when I got back inside. It was kind of my job to shovel the driveway, and I didn't really mind it. When it was snowing this badly though, it could really be tough. 
We had a pretty long and straight driveway, and I needed to shovel it now, even though it was still snowing. That way, the next morning, instead of having a whole foot of snow to shovel, there would be much less built up. It would be faster and easier as well. I went as quickly as I could, and things were going pretty well. Our neighborhood was generally pretty quiet, and not that many neighbors were outside or anything. We also lived in an area with only about 10 houses on it in total, so I pretty much knew all the neighbors and all their cars and stuff. When I had reached near the end of the driveway and was shoveling the very last section, I heard a car coming down our street. It entered and came around the corner, going very slowly. It was a larger and older looking black SUV. It looked to be a Chevy Suburban. I had never seen this car before and wondered whose it was. It slowly drove past me as I shoveled. It went around the loop of the cul-de-sac. It then started to come back down the street. At that point, I guessed it must have been somebody who turned down the wrong area and were going back around to go the right way. They were still going extremely slowly though. They started to slow down even further in front of our driveway. It kind of creeped me out a little bit. They did move past, but then pulled over on the side of the street, right in front of our house. It was only about 50 feet away from me. I wondered who on earth could be in there. In fact, I just wanted to run back inside of my house, right then and there. I figured that would be a bit weird though and decided to just continue shoveling. The car sat there with the engine running, and nobody attempted to get out of it. I glanced over, but I couldn't see who was inside at all. It was not a good angle, plus it was so dark, and the windows were heavily tinted. I tried desperately to hurry up and finish, so I wouldn't have to be around this strange vehicle any longer. That was when the SUV shut itself off, but nobody got out still. After two or three minutes of the SUV just sitting there, the doors opened. I was now almost at the end of the driveway. I saw a man get out of the car. He then began to walk over to me. He was tall and thin and wore a black jacket and jeans. He also wore a winter hat and had this long hair. When I saw he was walking straight for me, I really wanted to just get out of there. I told myself not to worry though, and that I shouldn't be afraid of people. The guy walked right up to me. Hello there, he said. I said hi back. I was starting to get really nervous. The man asked me if I needed some help shoveling the driveway, and said that he could help me if I wanted. I told him no thanks, and that I was just about done anyway. He then asked me if I lived there. I said yes. He stood there for a few moments as I finished up the last of the shoveling. He then said something that really creeped me out. Hey, do you want to ride anywhere? I asked him why. I could take you anywhere you want to go right now, if you want. I was really confused by this. I said no to the man. I needed to go inside right now. I started to walk away in a hurry. The guy stood there and watched me as I started heading back. When I'd made it about halfway up the driveway, I heard him running back to his car. It was a big relief. When I made it back inside, I told my parents right away about that weird guy. We looked out the window, but he was already gone. Now, this is one of the stranger things that's ever happened to me, but that night I stayed up kind of late. It was around 10 p.m. or so. I happened to glance out my window and noticed the SUV was back. I couldn't believe it. I kept my eyes on it. I could see the engine was running and the same man was probably inside. I was really hoping he wouldn't get out. I really couldn't believe he had come back. He was parked in the exact same place as before too. After about a minute the car drove away. I went and told my parents. My dad went outside but obviously the man was long gone by then. After that night I never saw the car or the man. The story still gives me the creeps when I think back to it though. I don't know why that guy came down our street or what he was doing. I'm really glad he didn't try to force me to go with him or do something even worse. 
Looking back, I probably should have gone inside as soon as I saw that car parking in our front yard. This is something really bizarre that happened to me last winter. I live by myself in a smaller one-story home. The neighborhood I live in is somewhat typical. However, I know most of the neighbors pretty well and get along with all of them. Last winter, we had a pretty bad snowstorm at one point. It was over a weekend and started one night at roughly 5 o'clock. The snow was supposed to last until early the next morning, and we were going to be getting several inches of it. Everything was normal other than the snowstorm. I went to bed at around 11 p.m. or so. I woke up the next morning at probably 7.30 or 8. My bedroom is at the front side of the house. As soon as I sat up and looked out the window, something really shocked me. There was a snowman that had been built outside, looking directly into my bedroom window. The snowman was very detailed and well done. It had eyes and a mouth made from buttons. It was probably about five feet away from my window. It really spooked me at first, until I realized what it actually was. Then I got spooked again, wondering how it even got there in the first place. I know I certainly hadn't made it. It had to have been my next door neighbor's kids. My next door neighbors were a husband and wife who had kids in their early teens and middle school ages. They were the only kids in the immediate area of the neighborhood. Still, it seemed kind of unlike them to do that. Why wouldn't they just build it in their own yard? Plus, they were really well behaved, and I didn't think they would go into my yard without permission. I went outside to snowplow my driveway. When I got out there, I saw my next door neighbor. His name is Todd. He was already out using the snowblower. I walked over to him at the end of his driveway and waved. He stopped his snowblower and said that I had a nice snowman in the front yard. I told him I had no idea how it even got there and asked him if maybe his kids had made it during the night. He said no. He told me he had been inside with them watching a movie the night before. He assumed I'd made it myself. We joked a bit after that. Though it was a funny thing, it was also a little bit strange. After that, I finished clearing my driveway and went back inside. The temperatures we were having were in the high 20s, all the way and up to the mid 30s. This created a good snowball or snowman type of snow. Fast forward to the next morning, I woke up and went into the kitchen. The kitchen is at the back side of my house. There's a window out to the backyard. When I looked out of it, there was a new snowman that hadn't been there the day before, facing the back window and looking right at me. It was just a few feet away. Somebody had made another one. This one, just like the first, was very well made, but unlike the other one, it had more props. Instead of just a face out of buttons, it had a gardening shovel used as its hand, and it was made to look like it was holding a pitchfork. That was when I realized this shovel and pitchfork had come from my garage. I went outside, then went to the garage. The door had been left open. Nobody was inside of it, though. I got really creeped out now. Somebody was going into my yard in the middle of the night and making snowmen. This time, they'd actually entered my garage. I had left the door unlocked by accident, I guess. I made sure to lock it usually. When whoever it was made that snowman in the front yard, I thought it was kind of funny. But now that it was in the backyard and they'd gone inside my property without permission, this was too far. Still though, I had no idea who was doing it. It was always in the middle of the night, and no matter how long I stayed awake, I never saw or heard anything. I looked out the windows multiple times that night before going to bed. I didn't see anybody. When I got up the next morning, both of the snowmen had been destroyed. They were just gone, nowhere to be seen. Somebody had torn them down and stolen the tools as well. I was really weirded out by the whole situation. After that, there were no more strange occurrences, though. No more snowmen, no more strange things happening. Still to this day, I wonder who was doing these things to me.
I was a captain in the army at the time these events took place. In my country, it's obligatory for all men to serve for 12 months in the military, usually when they're fairly young. That year, my job was to watch over the new soldiers in my battalion. I was known as a good captain, but I was strict at times, and had threatened some of the soldiers with detention for not doing their duties properly. One of the soldiers was this 23 to 25 year old guy. I can't exactly remember. He looked a bit younger and seemed scared and not really into this stuff. Let's call him Evan. One day, I punished him for a minor offense. I think he even teared up a bit. When I left in the evening, I saw him in the street staring at me, and that's when it all began. Before I explain what happened, I should say that I had seen some weird things but ignored them. For example, I saw that he had two cell phones. One smartphone and an old flip one. I knew in the area that some criminals tended to use these. I once heard someone on the other line call him boss. He approached me and started talking to me like I was not his superior. He demanded that I be good to the soldiers and do what he said from now on, that no one messes with him and things along those lines. It was nothing like the poor, scared boy I had seen before. Of course, I got really angry. I started shouting at him and told him he would get a 20-day detention if he was lucky. He didn't care. He told me I had 24 hours. I returned home really angry. I opened the door, but before I could lock it, I saw a big guy looking at me. Before I knew it, two other big guys appeared from behind me out of nowhere and grabbed my arms, one on each side. I tried to reason with them. The first guy approached me and punched me hard five times. They put me down and jumped me and beat the hell out of me. It took me an hour to get back on my feet. I called the colonel and told him I couldn't work because of my injuries. Of course, I didn't tell him exactly what happened. After some time, my phone began to ring. It was Evan on the other end. Where are you? Shall I send more to bring you over? If you don't show up until the evening, I'll send the boys to make you even more beautiful. He hung up at that point. I was scared as fuck. The next day, these bodyguards were banging at my door. I called Evan, apologized, and quit my job. He told me that if I did something he didn't approve of again, he would kill me and dismember me. It's been four months now. I work in a small minimum wage job, but the shock hasn't passed. I know his goons are keeping an eye on me. I saw two of those men in three different spots around town. I learned from friends that this guy is some sort of mafia don or something who sells protection. I guess you should never mess with those guys. I remember one night I just couldn't sleep for some reason. Every time I laid down to rest, I got this overwhelming feeling. I almost thought I could even hear a voice urging me to get up. I grabbed a book and stayed up, just listening to the thunderstorm while feeling a bit silly. Four hours later, at about 2 a.m., I felt like something was telling me to go get a glass of water. This was all so weird, but as long as I was already staying up until 2 a.m. because of a feeling, I might as well just follow what it said. As I walked down the stairs, I began to hear a sound coming from the office. A flip of the light switch revealed it was the first couple of drops of a coming leak. The roof had just been redone the week before, so of course I was a bit pissed off. Forgetting about grabbing a drink, I grabbed a bucket and was walking back into the room when the sound of the leak changed. Suddenly, it was like a hose pouring straight into the middle of the room. I threw the bucket underneath. As I was running back with trash bags to cover the computers, it changed. There were now sparks shooting off the floor, and the stream of water looked like a ribbon of glowing plasma. I stared in shock for a moment, before dropping the plastic to hit the light switch and sprinted to the circuit breaker. The rest of the night was waking up my family, climbing into the attic to make sure nothing was on fire. Scorch marks, yes. Flames or coals, no. 
and moving electronics out of the office. It turned out the storm had loosened and tore free a piece of flashing. The angle of the roof had then funneled all that water straight onto the heater and electrical wiring for that section of the house. Because I was in just the right place at the right time, I was able to protect the floor from the electrified water and contain it. I shut off the power just before it scorched the wood and ignited the house. In the end, because of that urge to stay up and walk past the office door, all that night cost us was a coat of paint for the ceiling. The roofing crew came back and fixed up the roof at no cost, because it was only a week old. It still made my skin crawl to look at the scorched wood inside the attic and all over the ceiling. To think about how my parents, sister, and even dogs slept through everything until I shook them awake. Well, technically, I tripped over the dog while waking up my parents, but close enough. What an extremely helpful auditory hallucination. This is a hard story to tell for a couple of reasons. First off, I was really young when this occurred, so the memory is not the clearest in the world. My parents have retold me the story to refresh my memory, but they tell it differently even between each other. The second reason I will tell you at the end of the story. I was six years old, and I was definitely a mama's boy. I followed my mom everywhere and always wanted her attention. I remained like this throughout her entire life. Well, when I was six years old, a cousin of mine named Ethan moved in with us. His parents had recently died in a fire, and his mom was my mom's sister. My mom took him in, and when she did, everything changed very dramatically. Ethan barely ever talked. I guess that's pretty normal for a kid who just lost his parents. Not only that, but he also lived in town, whereas we lived out in the country. I imagine he had friends that he could go out and play with all the time back there, but we lived far away in a house that wasn't close enough to other houses to know anyone around. I was the only one that Ethan really had to play with, but Ethan would not play. He wouldn't go outside or try to climb trees or anything like that. He wouldn't even play board games, really. What he did do, however, was something I definitely did not like. Ethan was super obsessed with my mother. I didn't like that at all. Being a mama's boy, I wanted all her attention. But Ethan would follow her around. Sometimes he would grab her skirt with his hand and hold it up, as if he was trying to keep her from getting away. If my mom or I tried to stop him from doing this, he would start screaming and crying. Everyone thought it was just easier to let him do what he was doing, and the entire time it made me really mad. I was really young though, and probably too young to go out and explore the woods, but with Ethan being around my mom all the time, it was really the only thing I had to do. One day, which actually turned out being a pretty weird one, I went out into the woods to have a quick look around. Being out there was a lot more enjoyable than I thought it would be. The sky was covered with dark thunder clouds, and I was in danger of getting caught up in a storm. I really loved the atmosphere of the darkness during the day though. The wind and the occasional bolt of lightning or crack of thunder that would pierce the darkness of that storm. I don't know how long I was out there really, and at first, I didn't really care. I just wanted to be by myself. However, when I decided to go home, I realized I had no idea how to get there. I tried walking back the way I came, but I couldn't be sure which way I'd come from. I hadn't taken the time to look at any landmarks that would remind me of the way out of this place. I was too young at the time to even think of that. The only Lost in the Woods story I ever heard was Hansel and Gretel, and I didn't have any crumbs of bread to lay down so I could remember my path. I was worried. I thought it would be easy to find my way home. I only had to keep walking the same amount of time I'd walked into the woods, and surely that would lead me back out. My six-year-old mind accepted that as solid fact, as silly as it might seem nowadays. 
Well, as you might imagine, my idea didn't quite work, and the storm kept brewing and brewing. I was expecting it to break at any moment, and that scared me too. I'm not scared of storms themselves, but I've never been stuck out in one before. The idea of doing that is what scared me. Fortunately, despite the fact it seemed like it would storm any moment, it didn't start raining. For that, I was thankful. I kept thinking I would get even more lost by the minute, and I would never find my way home. I thought about bobcats, coyotes, animals that were in the area, and the idea scared the hell out of me. Even if the animals didn't get me first, I didn't have any food or water. My young mind was convinced I was definitely going to die out there. Then I saw something in the distance. It was smoke. I immediately thought that someone, possibly even my own father, had made some sort of bonfire. Maybe they could help take me back to my family. So I walked in the direction of that smoke. I was a lot less scared than I had been before. I knew I was going to get out of those woods and everything would be okay. I even remember smiling and running a little toward the smoke. As I got closer, I realized that smoke was definitely coming from my yard. I thought maybe my parents were worried I'd gotten lost in the woods and made a smoke signal to help me get home. I sprinted the rest of the way back into the yard of my house. My heart dropped, though, when I got close enough to see what was actually going on. No one had built a bonfire to help me find my way out of the woods. The house I'd lived in for my entire life was on fire, and not just any small fire either. The entire house was engulfed in flames. I stopped in the woods, looking at the most horrifying scene I had ever seen in my life. I didn't know what to think until I saw my family standing in the yard. My parents were there and Ethan was standing beside my mom as always. I ran out of the woods directly toward them. My mom grabbed me and hugged me. She didn't know I had gone out into the woods. She thought I had been left behind in the house somewhere. She thought I might be dead and she was absolutely terrified until she noticed me emerging from the woods. The fire department came quickly, but it didn't really matter much. There wasn't a lot they could do, as there were no hydrants out this far in the country. The truck had a tank of water if I remember right, but that didn't stop our home from burning right down to its foundation. The official report was that the house was burned down by an accident. However, even being six years old, I did not accept that. It seemed too weird to me. Ethan's parents died in a house fire, and less than three months after he came to live with us, our house caught fire as well. It seemed like an awfully weird coincidence to me. Yeah, I think Ethan burned down his own house and killed his parents. I think he burned down our house too, and maybe tried to kill us. I kept that thought to myself for many years. Ethan is on the autistic spectrum, which I think might explain his behavior with my mom. I don't think that has anything to do with him burning down houses though, so please don't think that. I think completely separate from his disability, he's just kind of an evil little fuck. My grandma took him in and adopted him basically after that. I only saw Ethan when we went to visit my maternal grandma, and I was glad he was gone. No other houses burned down as far as I know, so maybe I was wrong about him but it just seems a little bit weird that it happened so close together. I grew up as a sort of only child with my mother. My father and her were not together, but I don't want to go too deep into that. Although my mother never had any other kids, my father eventually had a boy and a girl, so I had two half-siblings who were about 10 and 8 years younger than I was respectively. I occasionally would do things with my dad, such as staying with him for a week or so here and there. It was nice to see my brother and sister grow up, and sometimes we went on hiking and camping trips. That was always pretty fun. Well, maybe not necessarily always. There was one time when it was no fun at all, and that's the story I'm about to tell. We had what you would call a sort of close call. 
We went out camping by the river on a sandbar. I was 16 years old at the time. My brother was eight, and my sister was six. We had three tents set up on the sandbar. There was one for my dad, one for me, and one for my siblings to share. We were going to be there for a few days and try our luck at fishing in the river. Everything was set up really good. My dad and I gathered wood, and we made a good bonfire. We got some coals going to start cooking some of the fish we'd caught. Fishing was something all four of us could do, although it was only my dad who caught anything that we were actually able to eat. It seems like a bit of a waste to try and cook minnows. While we were cooking, we heard something from down the river. It took a little bit, but we noticed a boat coming down towards us. The people in the boat were acting really loud and rowdy, making tons of noise and such. Even before they got close to us, my dad and I figured out they must have been really, really drunk. When they got close to us, we saw they were all college-aged kids. When they noticed us, they started waving and such. Then they steered the boat towards the sandbar we were camping on. They anchored the boat by the sandbar, just a little ways up from where we were camping. At first, I thought they were going to try and make their own camp and not really have any involvement with us. How wrong I was. It was two couples and a single guy. They were all drunk and stoned off their asses. But the single guy was the most drunk one of all. I couldn't figure out how this guy was even able to stand, that's how out of it he was. They were playing loud music, acting all rowdy. They brought their boombox and their beer, and eventually came over to our bonfire. They just inserted themselves. We didn't say anything. My dad was in his late 40s and I was 16, but we knew we had to be careful with a bunch of drunken students. Alcohol can change a person dramatically. My dad and I talked with them, mostly just to keep them happy. After a while, though, one of the couples asked to borrow one of the tents. Before anyone could say anything, I offered mine. I had a good idea of why they wanted it in the first place, and I figured better to offer mine before one of the younger kids tried. They were in the tent for about three minutes. Just a side note from the story right now, but if you're going to ask a bone, why would you only do it for three minutes? I mean, come on, what could you possibly accomplish in three minutes? The other couple were pretty shit-faced. I was wondering how everybody hadn't passed out yet. In fact, several times their eyes would close and they would sway back and forth. The single guy was the one that scared me the most, though. He had this big knife that was sheathed and strapped onto his belt. I had been keeping my eye on him the whole time, just in case he decided to use it. He did take it out, and I was about to do something, but he walked away from us. There was a tree stump out on the edge of the sandbar. He went over and kept throwing the knife at it over and over again. My dad had a fillet knife to use for the fish. It was the sharpest knife I had ever seen in my life. He kept it on him the whole time. I went and grabbed the hatchet we used to chop the wood and kept it close to me as well. I decided I knew what I had to do. I went to all of the tents and took the sleeping bags out of them. I do wish I had taken my sleeping bag out before I allowed those two to go at it inside, but oh well. I moved all the bags into my dad's tent. We were all going to sleep in there. The kids were confused because I don't think they knew what was going on at all. They complained because they wanted their own tents, but I made them stop. The five college students then decided to go play in the water. They were swimming around, splashing and such. A couple of them started cussing, and two of the guys, the single guy and one of the couples, began to fight. I don't know how bad the fighting was. I tried to stay out of it as much as possible. We all went into the tent when it was dark enough. We had lights to read books, but it was really hard the whole time. They kept playing loud music, cussing, and doing who knows what. At one point, we noticed shadows outside. Two of the students had come right up to our tent, and it seemed like they were fighting again. I grabbed my hatchet, totally prepared to use it if I had to. One of the guys stumbled and nearly fell onto us, but he was able to right himself in time. My brother and sister somehow were able to fall asleep, 
but my dad and I remained wide awake. We listened for hours as they continued to argue, cuss, and fight. Eventually, at around 4 a.m., I heard the boat start up and listened as it rowed away. Finally, I was able to get a little bit of sleep. When we got up in the morning, we noticed that one of our coolers had been thrown into the fire. The other two tents had been trampled on and were leveled. Fortunately, that was the only thing they did, and none of us got hurt. You never know what people will do when their state is altered. I'm not judging, though. Hell, later in my life, I parted harder than they did, and that was only a few years later. But that was one of the scariest nights I ever experienced. I, 24 and female, moved into a new neighborhood about two years ago with my partner, who's 33, and our child. After six months of living there, in the beginning of the pandemic, we started getting to know our immediate neighbors. They seemed to be homebodies and stayed inside almost all the time. After a bit, they started coming out to talk more, and we all seemed to get along just fine. I'd even considered inviting them over a few times. They could be a bit awkward, though, and difficult to keep conversations going with. We've done paint nights outside a few times, but haven't invited each other inside ever. The couple seems to come outside whenever we're outside coincidentally. They include themselves in our activities and chat here and there and given them some socialization they might have needed, since they tended to dwell inside in the dark, playing video games constantly. I gave my number to the girl when we had an issue between units, just in case of emergencies. We'd exchanged a few messages about the property management, the weather, and stuff like that, but only a few really. Lately, I hadn't been seeing the woman out as much as before, but the guy was always outside every time I was. He started sitting in a lawn chair on his front step daily, for hours at a time. Fast forward and a friend of mine comes to spend the night. I introduced the neighbor guy to my friend to be polite. He met her dog, said a few random things, and then he went back to sitting on the step for several hours that night. Some days later, he signals me with a psst and asks if everything's okay. I tell him I'm fine and ask what he means. He proceeds to tell me I was sending him mixed signals when my friend was over, and he wanted to make sure I was alright. That didn't make a single bit of sense to me, but I said sorry for the confusion. I assured him I was fine, and went about my usual business. A couple more days pass by. I get a text from him saying who it is, and that he hopes my child and I have a great day. I didn't give him my number, so I found it to be a bit weird, and didn't answer. I started realizing he had been sitting outside in the morning at the time I usually work daily. He would sit outside within 15 minutes of me getting home as well, regardless of the time. The guy would stay out until 4 a.m. some nights, waiting for me to arrive. And the crazier part is, I noticed he would always go inside within 20 minutes of me leaving. He would stay outside for 14 full hours as long as I was home, though. Didn't go out if my partner was home and I was not. Didn't come out if no one was home. He always knew if I was home somehow, even if I switched cars with my partner. I'm uncomfortable, but I don't want to point fingers and make it worse. This dude won't talk to my partner at all, hardly acknowledges him. Meanwhile, he always tries to find ways to talk to me, tries to help walk my dogs to the car for me, tries to play games with my child, knocks on my door asking if I've lost random items that aren't mine. He even texted me a few more times. I've seen all of this on my security cameras, since we've been paying attention to the odd behavior, I can't tell if it's just a super weird coincidence or if he's purposefully watching me every time. Not to mention he makes hand gestures and speaks to himself with no phone out and no headphones. 
One time, I walked a few doors down to visit some other neighbors, when I noticed him getting the mail, which he's never done, right in front of the house I was in. Later, he tried to talk to those neighbors about something as well. Another. I mentioned a yard sale I was having up the road. He never takes walks, but that day he just decided to. I had also recently got a new game console, and he surprisingly gifted me with two $60 games for it, even though I never told him I had one. The other neighbors said he's never sat outside like this before, not in the past five years they've known him. His girlfriend also started questioning him about it. I walked out and overheard her quite upset, with him sarcastically replying, that's just the kind of guy I am. Let's not forget, my boyfriend's car tires were also randomly slashed in our neighborhood. Am I paranoid over these odd coincidences, or do I need to move? I'm a nurse who works the night shift, and there have been two different occasions when I've been stalked on my way home. I'd like to share them with you. This happened when I lived in Chikawa, Tokyo. I was returning home on the last train of the night. It was around 12.30 a.m. or so. When you get off the train and exit the subway, there's a convenience store right at the top of the stairs. My apartment at the time was about seven minutes away from this store, in a residential area. At that time of night when you get off the last train home, the lights of the convenience store are pretty much the only light source in the area. The roads are usually empty as well. Back to the story. I was climbing up the subway stairs when I noticed a man waiting at the top of them, staring down at me. His eyes widened further and further as he stared at me. He was shifting around restlessly. At that moment, I knew something was weird about this guy. I ignored the traffic lights and crossed the road as soon as possible. I took a quick look over my shoulder and decided quickly to walk home, since the situation was abnormally creepy. As I was walking, though, I felt a looming presence behind me. I looked back over my shoulder once more and noticed that weird guy from the entrance of the subway was following me. He was closing the distance between us without any hesitation. I instinctively started running. I remember running like crazy. I was so panicked and frightened. There was no one on the streets to help me, not a single car passing by, and it was so dark everywhere. I remember I ran up a path onto someone's private garden and pushed the gate aside. I hid in their yard as I crept around the back of the house. I peeked around the corner back at the road. I saw a taxi pass by and I saw my chance. The taxi driver must have seen how scared I was because they slowed down right away and that really saved me that night. After that startling event, I moved into an apartment right in front of a different train station. This area was one that was much safer, as it had a 24-hour taxi and buses and was well lit. It was also busy with many people, even during the nighttime. It was much more reassuring. I had been living in this new place for about two years when something else happened to me. Of course, it took place when I was coming home from my night shift. Back in those days, when I left the hospital to go home, I used to take a shortcut through this dark alley. It was there that I was certain I met the same man once again. I remember quickly heading to the train station and boarding my train when I noticed the man once more. As I sat down, I could tell a man was staring at me. Some guy had followed me onto the train. I had a terrible feeling about this. This guy kept glancing at me and fidgeting around in his seat. The train pulled into my station. I got as close as I could to the doors, and as soon as they opened, I ran out as fast as I could. I sprinted to an exit I knew would be busy. I even took off my jacket and tried to blend into the crowd of people. When I thought I found a safe place to hide, I looked over my shoulder. Sure enough, he was right there behind me, 
desperately searching the area to find me. I knew how much danger I was in. Luckily, there was a police box at the west exit of the station. In the following days, I became paranoid that man might know where I lived or might wait to ambush me in a more well-hidden place next time. I told the police everything I could about the man. One of the officers seemed familiar with the man I was speaking of and described him as a real pervert. When he said that, shivers went down my spine. There are a lot of young nurses in Japan who work late like I did back then. It's been 10 years on now, and I still get creeped out thinking about those nights. As peaceful as Japan can be, you really have to be careful when walking home at night, especially if you're all alone. Four years ago, I rented an Airbnb to stay in for the holidays. I was seeing my family for the week of Christmas, so I got a place that was just a few miles away. When I arrived on December 20th, everything was exactly as I thought it would be. The place was a very regular house, in a very normal neighborhood. Overall, I was satisfied. I got in there around 6 on that first day, though, and didn't feel like going out to see anyone, at least not until I'd gotten a good night's rest first. I stayed in and relaxed for the rest of the night, watching some TV and even getting a little bit of work done as well. I got in bed just before 10pm and fell asleep quite quickly. In the middle of the night, though, I slowly woke up to a noise coming from downstairs. I was still half asleep and didn't even check the time. It sounded like small thumps against the wall coming from somewhere inside the house. As I listened to these noises, I didn't really feel worried or anything. Rather, it almost sounded like it was the house making those noises they tend to do at night sometimes. I only stayed awake for a minute or so before drifting into sleep once again. I don't recall waking up any other times during the night. By morning, I had forgotten and didn't even think about the noises I was hearing again. I was pretty sure it was just the unit creaking or something along those lines. Anyway, I let my family know I'd made it into town and we got our plans set for dinner at their place. I relaxed at the Airbnb for the whole morning and afternoon until I was ready to head out. I grabbed my bag and keys, and then walked up to the front door to exit the house. When I opened it, to my surprise, I found myself standing face to face with a man who was just waiting out on my porch. Needless to say, it completely caught me off guard, and I just stood there looking at him for a second, before even saying anything. Can I help you? I asked the man. He didn't knock or ring the doorbell or anything, which made me start wondering. How long could he have just been standing there for, and why was he here to begin with? The man did not respond to my question, though. Instead, he nodded and walked away. I watched him go down to the sidewalk and just continue walking down the street until he was out of sight. I couldn't see any situation where this wouldn't be strange and creepy. Why was he at the Airbnb, and for how long had he just been waiting there outside without attempting to make contact? I made sure the place was locked up tight, then drove to my parents' house for dinner with the family. I brought up the situation as an interesting story, and everyone else seemed to think it was just as creepy as I did. Dinner was quite nice, and we had plenty of other great conversations, catching up on life and everything. That whole night, though, I couldn't stop thinking about that strange man and if the things I'd left at the Airbnb were going to be stolen or something by the time I got back. I ended up leaving the dinner get-together at around 9 and getting back to the Airbnb about 15 minutes later. I parked in the driveway and walked up to the front door, looking around for any obvious signs of someone having been there while I was gone. I didn't see anything out of place. I unlocked the door and stepped in. I walked down to the end of the hallway and into the kitchen, dropping my keys and the bag on the counter. Then there was a sudden thump, just the same as the ones I'd heard the previous night. 
Now that I was downstairs, it was far louder and clearly coming from one side of the house. I slowly stepped into the room near where the sound was coming from, but then the thump came again from a door right next to me. I jumped back, getting a surge of adrenaline. After staring at the door for a few seconds, I could hear the faint sounds of heavy breathing coming from the other side. I grabbed my keys and ran for my car. I still didn't know exactly what was going on here, but I was not going to stick around to find out all on my own. I called 911 and waited for them to arrive. When they did, I watched them go in and search for a few minutes. Then they came out and told me something horrifying. The door this person was behind was the garage door, which showed signs of distress from the person likely trying to break the lock and get inside. Unbeknownst to me, there was a side door connected to the garage that led outside, which had been left unlocked by whoever had stayed there before me. I didn't ever plan to use the garage, so I'd never bothered to check it. Whether the man I'd seen on the porch was the same person that was in the garage is unknown, but just knowing I was asleep while someone was right below me trying to break into the house is terrifying. What were they trying to achieve after breaking in? We have no way of knowing. Obviously, after that though, I went and stayed at a hotel for the rest of the week instead. I still find myself thinking about that situation, even four years later. I had to do a long drive across the US to get back home after visiting a friend of mine. I was 19, so naturally I was convinced I was invincible. I'm a woman and had pulled into a mountain town. It was about 11 p.m. or so and I was super tired. Although I was only three hours away from home now, I knew it wouldn't be safe to continue driving. For reference, I'm five foot two and I had plenty of cash on me at the time. I booked myself in for the night at the motel. It was really quiet, with only two vehicles in the parking area, one of them being a large white van. I know how that sounds, but I didn't really think anything of it. I mean, maybe it was the clerk's van, and he needed it for transporting things or something. The clerk was a man, and I immediately got a sketchy vibe from him. He seemed hell-bent on trying to creep me out for some reason. His idea of making conversation was to immediately say, A young girl like you ought to be careful. You know, these trees have witnessed many things around here. Pretty young things like you disappear all the time. I know that sounds like a horror movie, but believe me, that's what I felt like in the moment. I think he was prompted to say this because he asked where I was headed, and I was deliberately vague with him, just saying I was going somewhere important, but I needed to rest before I continued. The clerk kept pushing. Well, are you traveling alone? I said, yeah, it's just me. He then gave me this ominous warning. He was tall and skinny, and had ginger hair and really dark brown eyes. He reeked of cigarette smoke. In fact, the whole check-in area stank of it. He told me he would be at the desk if I needed any help. I was too tired to dwell on things any further. I went to my room and made sure my door was locked up and the windows were all covered. The room didn't smell too bad and nothing seemed that weird. That is, until I realized that none of the lights inside were working. I used my phone as a flashlight and went to the bed. There were cigarette butts all over it, and the pillows were also wrecked. I could see stab marks in them, and they looked filthy, just full of grime, as if they hadn't been washed in ages. I realized there were also cigarette butts inside the pillows where the stab holes were. I felt incredibly uneasy, but I told myself not to be ridiculous. I mean, that sort of thing happens at motels all the time, right? I couldn't ignore that uneasy feeling developing in my stomach, though. I pulled the covers back and at least the sheets were clean. I decided to sleep without anything over me. I lay there for about half an hour, but no matter how tired I was, I could not doze off. 
I was creeped out by every single noise from outside. I kept telling myself to chill out. It's just an unfamiliar environment, but I could leave right after a few hours of rest. Daylight would be here before I knew it anyway. I must have eventually dozed off at some point, but not for very long. I awoke with a start, my heart hammering in my chest. The door was being knocked on. I grabbed my phone to check the time and saw it was 1.15 a.m. I had not been sleeping for very long. Obviously, I felt uneasy. I mean, who the hell would be knocking on my door at this time? There were no people around, and I had the curtains drawn so I couldn't see outside. I was scared to look, yet I knew I had to. I got up very cautiously and gripped my phone, ready to use it as a weapon if need be. I moved the curtain aside, and I could see the outline of a tall man. I realized it was the clerk. Confused and still feeling on edge, I opened the door slightly. I was still shielding myself so he couldn't burst in. His face was blank, and he just stared at me. Hello? I looked down at his hand and realized he was holding a cup. It was one of those takeout coffee cups you get in cafes. It had a lid on it and I couldn't tell what was inside. He held it out to me and said he knew I was tired from my trip. He thought he'd get me some caffeine to help me wake up. I was confused. I didn't answer due to my confusion. He gestured toward me again and I finally just said, what? He looked at me and explained he got me coffee because I was so tired from my long drive and he wanted to help me out. My uneasiness spiked to new levels. I felt a sense of dread creep over me. I told him that was nice of him and all, but I would be fine after a good night's rest. Thank you anyways. I went to shut the door, but he wedged his foot inside and insisted I take this drink from him. I'm not stupid. I don't care if it sounds paranoid. I know better than to accept a drink from a stranger, especially this guy, in these circumstances. Instead of insisting on declining though, I decided it would be best to accept it and not drink it. I took it from him, afraid he would grab my arm or something. Luckily for me, he didn't. He smiled a sinister smile at me and told me to take it easy before he walked away. As he did, I quickly shut the door and locked it behind him. I stood at the curtain, staring outside. I saw him go over to the white van in the parking lot and jump in the passenger side. I took the lid off the coffee, and only then did I realize it was not very hot at all. I wondered how long it had been sitting for. It did smell like coffee, but I also thought I might have smelled something else. I knew better than to risk taking a sip of it. I wasn't sure what to do. I was afraid to leave in case he ambushed me or followed me to my car. It wasn't that far away, but they could still come after me in his van if I drove out or run at me in the lot. What if he had other people waiting and watching me? What if he came back later? Surely he knew I'd lock the door, so even if he did drug me, he wouldn't be able to do anything. I mean, he could. Maybe he had a master key to all the rooms or something. Or he could smash the window and jump in. So many scenarios and questions were running through my head. And I was way too frightened to go to sleep. I felt like I was in a horror game. This was my safe room. I knew I had to get out of here and fast. By the grace of God, the bathroom windows were quite big. The motel rooms were on the ground floor, so I had an idea. I left the coffee on the floor of the main room and went into the bathroom. I'd looked in there before sleeping, but I hadn't paid close attention to the windows. I reckoned I could just about squeeze out of them. It was above the bathtub and not very high up. I knew I had to try. It would take me out behind the building. I opened it as wide as I could and hoisted myself upward. I managed to get out thanks to being short and thin. I landed hands and face first, but it didn't matter. At least I was out of the motel room undetected. I had my phone in my jeans pocket, so it was safe as well. Thankfully, it didn't get smashed or anything. I crouched down and crept slowly to the edge of the building. I could see into the parking lot. I knew the clerk still had to be in the van, but of course it was way too dark to really see anything. It was then that I thought about how he'd gotten into the passenger side, meaning someone else was behind the wheel. 
Had they been there when I arrived? Was this all a pre-planned thing? I had to take some deep breaths to calm myself down. I didn't have strong cell phone service. I could have tried calling the cops, but the signal was just so weak up in these mountains. It was even worse where I stood at the back of the motel area. I was scared the light from the phone would attract unwanted eyes to find me. I hid away behind the motel for a long time. I was too afraid to move. I knew I had to time this perfectly or something disastrous could occur. I had to abide my time. It was really bitterly cold outside, and I was shivering, but I had to stand there and wait. I stood for a long time, I don't know how long, until I heard a noise. I carefully peeked around the side of the building, where I saw the white van's thin doors open. The clerk got out with another man, who looked similar to him. They disappeared out of sight. I darted out of sight too, petrified. I felt incredibly vulnerable, and my heart was racing. I could hear movement, but I wasn't sure what they were doing. I heard footsteps approaching. Then I heard the clerk talking to the man. I'll knock. I then heard knocking on the motel door. I knew it had to be mine. I could barely breathe. I was so scared. Another voice then talked to him. I think it worked. This voice was higher than the clerk's, with an eerie calmness to it, as if they were talking about the weather. I knew in that moment the coffee had something in it. I heard the jingling of keys, as someone fiddled with them. A sinking feeling came over me. I was right to think it was possible the clerk had some sort of master key that would open the door despite it being locked. If they went in and didn't see me there, would they check the bathroom? I hadn't shut the window behind me. It was still wide open, so they'd find me. I knew I had to act now and fast. I couldn't mess this up, or I was done for. They were clearly planning something very sinister. I heard the footsteps enter the motel room. I darted out, refusing to look back. I couldn't hear anything around me except my own heartbeat. I jumped into my car and sped out of the parking lot without daring to look behind me at any point. I was trembling, but I couldn't stop. I knew I had to drive no matter what. I didn't stop driving until I got home. When I finally arrived, I just sat in the living room. I was shaking until 5 a.m. My parents were still asleep. When they woke up, I told them everything that happened, and they called the police. I didn't sleep until like 11 that day, and I had to wake up at 1 p.m. The police took me seriously. They went to the motel that I described, but they didn't find any evidence of wrongdoing. The van was there, but there was nothing inside of it. The clerk was there, but he was apparently alone. There was no sign of another man, and the coffee was long gone. Apparently, my motel room only had a single sheet and nothing else inside. I begged the police to do something, because this guy clearly had a plan set up for me, but they told me there was nothing else they could do. It's been a few years since all this happened, and it put me off from motels for life. I don't like driving super long distances anymore either. I'd much rather stick to getting on a plane to take me wherever I need to go. I feel like the stars align for me in that night. In some ways, I'm lucky I'm short, even though I've always longed to be taller. I'm not sure a taller person would have fit through that window. I ignored my instincts a little, but at least I knew something was up, and I was on edge enough to be aware. I'm so glad I didn't drink that coffee. I feel lucky he didn't insist I drink it right in front of him or something. I really hope nothing like this happens to anyone else. This happened when I was in my early 20s. I was working in a retail store in a mall, but there weren't enough hours to go around. I asked if there was anything else I could do. My boss told me the location of another mall that needed more people, so I could go there on my weekends. I needed to take the bus route that was a bit longer, but I didn't have to make any transfers at least. I got up early and caught the earliest one I could. The bus ride was fairly normal. I got to see parts of my city that I hadn't seen before. I did notice the bus eventually went through a more dingy neighborhood. There was more trash everywhere, abandoned buildings and houses, abandoned cars as well. 
I noticed it, but I felt like I was safely on the bus, and my destination was in a nice neighborhood anyway. At some point, an older lady got on the bus, and I noticed that no one was getting up to offer her a seat. I gave her mine and went to go hold the pole next to the side door of the bus. I continued on my way. While riding, I remember looking at a guy next to me and asking if he knew about how much longer it would take to get to my stop. Before he answered, though, someone hit the buzzer to get off. The doors next to me opened, and then I felt hands on my free arm, grabbing me and pulling me. On reflex, I clenched up immediately, because I generally don't like any physical contact with strangers outside of a greeting or a handshake. I really think that reflex saved my life because it took my brain a few seconds to register that someone was trying to pull me off the bus right now. A tall man in a white tank top, blue jeans and white tennis shoes had come out of the back of the bus and grabbed my arm and was trying to drag me off right now. He'd pulled me down to the second step before I even knew what was going on. I was just barely hanging onto the pole. The arm he was grabbing had my purse on it, so I actually tried to shake my purse down to him so he'd let go. He had no interest, though. I had just about started calling for help when I felt someone grab my waist and pull me back up towards the bus. The man trying to pull me down must have realized he could no longer get me out without dragging this on longer than he'd expected. So he finally gave up and ran off. That was it. The guy ran off, the door shut once again, and I vaguely remember hearing the man who saved me say something along the lines of, You might die if you get off in that neighborhood. I had apparently gone into some sort of shock, because I only remember saying, Oh. I don't even remember thanking him. I didn't say anything to the driver. I didn't contact the police like I should have. I don't even remember my shift at the other location. I don't remember the ride home either. It's like I just went numb. When I was back at home and had completely showered and gotten ready for bed in my nightgown, I sat on the edge of my bed and thought about what happened. Did I almost get kidnapped in front of a bus full of people? I had a lot of regrets about this. I regret not contacting the police in case the guy went after another woman. At least then a woman would be aware he was out there. I regret not thanking and keeping contact with that nice person who saved me. I actually posted an article in my local Craigslist in hopes of him somehow hearing it and knowing how grateful I am. I was about 15 minutes from finishing the night shift at work when there was a massive crash in one of the windows in the office. I got up to go check it out, only to see that someone had thrown quite a sizable rock through one of the windows on the front of the building. This was especially weird because I was working in the industrial district at 11.30 at night with none of the other businesses opened. I went back to my desk and put a quick call through to security to let them know what happened. At that point, I decided it would be best to head home. As I was leaving the building, I was freaking myself out about it more and more. I ended up running to my car and getting in and taking off as fast as I could. I was almost home and I'd started to calm down a bit when I realized I did not unlock my car when I got in. It had been unlocked the whole time. I did a quick check with my hand in the back seat, but there was nothing there. Fast forward 30 minutes. I called a friend of mine who said he was out drinking at a bar nearby. I decided I was going to go join him. I jumped on my bicycle and started riding over. I was riding along the road on my bike. It was quite a nice night and I was in no big rush. I was just enjoying the moonlight when I began to hear someone riding right behind me. I straightened up and stuck to one side of the road. This guy passed me by really slowly, and when he was right beside me, he shot me a big smile that I can only describe as purely insane. I kind of flinched, and I was taken aback. I realized he was riding on my mom's bike. Needless to say, I turned around and went home. 
When I got there, sure enough, her bike was missing, and one of my car doors was open. This person must have somehow been hiding behind me the entire drive home. I remember it was about 9pm, and the kids' parents would be getting home in about an hour. I had put the kids to bed, and I was downstairs watching TV by myself. Every so often, though, the TV would flicker with static. To be honest, it was kind of starting to scare me. It wasn't until the point when I looked up from the TV and out of the nearby window when I lost it. There wasn't actually anything outside, but it seemed as if in the reflection... I could see what looked to be a tall man standing not too far away from me, behind the couch. Needless to say, there was not actually anything there. When I snapped my head to look at the spot where it had been standing in the reflection, I didn't find anything. I grabbed all my stuff and wanted to get out of that house then and there. Instead, I ran upstairs and actually sat down quietly where the kids were sleeping until the parents arrived back home. I particularly remember when the parents arrived and I had started to leave. I was pulling out of their driveway in my old Ford. When I looked up into the kids' bedroom window, I saw the same reflection I'd seen earlier looking back down at me with a hand raised as if waving goodbye. After that incident, I never babysat anyone ever again. I worked at a women's clothing mail-order catalog call center. During training, a veteran worker was talking about getting to know the frequent callers and the story of one of them. This old lady used to call in often. She was blind but would have someone help her pick things out. The manager of her apartment complex, I think. She would order often and they got to know her by name. Eventually, she stopped calling in, so they contacted the number they had for her, which was the apartment manager's number. The old lady was perfectly fine, but she had moved to a new building. Even though she was blind, she was very meticulous with her cleaning. She cleaned everything often. The manager had come in to do some maintenance for the first time in many months, and noticed that in every room of her apartment just above her head level, there were thick webs and nests of black widow spiders, hundreds of them. Can you imagine an oblivious old lady walking around blind in a house she thinks she's made spotless, but there's a soul-freezing nightmare swarming all over the ceiling? Needless to say, they had to get her out of there before she ended up getting bit by one of them or something. Thankfully, the old lady is still alright to this day. I'm 22 now, but this happened when I was 16. At the time, I lived in Staten Island, New York. For a little background, I'm a woman, and at the time, I was 120 pounds soaking wet, with a height of 5 foot 6. I thought I was invincible. I never imagined anything like this would have ever happened to me. It was March 17th of 2013, around 10.30pm or so. I was leaving my boyfriend's house. He'd walked me to the local bus stop as he always did. We joked and laughed while we waited for my bus to show up. It was kind of late. There weren't many cars on the street. I happened to notice a black SUV parked right across the road. I didn't think too much of it at the moment. My bus eventually did show up and I said goodbye to my boyfriend. I boarded and took a seat next to the bus driver. The bus was completely empty. The driver turned to me once we hit the first red light, and then he asked, What are you doing out this late? It was random and a bit creepy. Oh, I was just hanging out with my boyfriend. We made small talk and my initial apprehension was put at ease. The driver then told me it wasn't exactly safe to be out and about at this hour, and that I should be more careful. I nodded, but as I said before, 
I was an arrogant 16-year-old who thought she was invincible. As my stop approached, I looked down at my phone. It read 11.30 p.m. My battery was down to 5%. Wow, that's not great, I thought to myself. I exited the bus and said goodbye to the driver. He told me to stay safe, and I gave him another nod as the door folded back shut. For some reason, I just stood there and watched the bus make its way down the street until its taillights were well out of sight. As I stood there at the empty bus stop, a sensation of what I can only describe as impending doom washed over me. I made my way to the bench to sit down. The bus I needed to go to that dropped me off near my house was scheduled to arrive at 11.40, only 10 minutes left. As I sat there staring off into space, thinking about some things I had to do when I got home, a black SUV pulled right up to the bus stop. The uneasy feeling I had earlier intensified, but I did my best to play it cool. The man rolled down his window and called out to me, Hey, excuse me, do you know what time the bus is supposed to be here? He appeared to be a mix between Hispanic and Asian, and had a medium build. At this point in time, I did not make the connection that this may be the same vehicle I saw just before I boarded the first bus. I figured he was probably waiting for somebody, so I replied that it would not be long. He then asked me how long I'd been waiting. It was then that I started to get a little bit freaked out. This guy was really giving me the creeps. I considered if I might just be overreacting. Perhaps he was just trying to pass the time. Still, I kept my guard up. I answered that I hadn't been there waiting long. He proceeded to try and make more small talk. I was trying to be polite, but I also kept looking at my pitch black phone screen, trying to subtly hint to him that I was not interested in conversation. It was dark out by this point. The only luminescence was coming from some nearby street lights. However, there were also two big trees outside the bus stop, positioned in such a way that they blocked out most of the light. If this guy tried anything, the dark would have provided decent cover. I nervously clenched my phone, with the uncomfortable feeling inside increasing with every passing second. He told me he was new to the area and didn't know his way around too well. He claimed that he was in the army and was stationed nearby. He then asked me where the beach was. It's just down the street. I told him in a very matter-of-fact way, as to convey that maybe he should go there instead of talking to me. It was then that our eyes met, and I could see his face very clearly. His eyes were not like a normal human's eyes. It was as if they were looking right through me, staring at me like a hungry fox who just discovered a trapped and defenseless rabbit. He then asked me, Would you mind showing me around a bit? Come on, get in the car for a little while. I may have been a naive 16-year-old, but I was not an idiot. I knew that if I got in that car, that would be the last time anyone ever heard from me again. I was trying my best to show him that I wasn't afraid, so I politely declined while looking down the street for my bus. He then began to beg and plead. It was kind of pathetic, honestly. I told him no once again. He then said something that I'll never forget. Come on, baby. It won't take long. At that moment, my blood ran cold. My stomach felt like it was going to drop right out my ass. I felt absolutely sick like I was going to throw up. Thankfully, at that moment, my bus was appearing in sight and coming down the street. A feeling of relief washed over me. I told him no, once again thinking that would be the end of it. He then told me he would drive me right home afterward. This guy would just not give up. I finally had enough. With all my strength and courage in me, I shouted at him to leave me the hell alone and called him a fucking loser. As my bus pulled up, I heard him say something genuinely terrifying, and I quote, Fine, bitch. I'll just follow you and see where you live. My heart started to race. My hands broke out in a cold sweat, and my body began to tremble with fear. I quickly got on the bus. Honestly, I don't know why I didn't tell the bus driver. I think I was just in a state of shock. 
I was hoping that Mr. Boyspade Hunter in the SUV didn't mean what he'd said, and he was just pissed off and trying to scare me. When I sat down and looked out the window, though, I saw the headlights of the SUV tailing the bus. I thought I was going to have a mental breakdown. When the bus finally arrived at my stop, I ran like hell. I reached the front door of my house, which was usually unlocked. Tonight of all nights, though, it was locked from top to bottom. I frantically rang the doorbell while going through my back to find my keys. I heard someone pull up out front. Without turning around, I knew who it was. Just like in the movies, I dropped the keys I was trying to put into the front door. I finally managed to unlock the front door. Before turning the handle, I heard a car door slam shut from behind me. I quickly ran inside and slammed the door shut in a panic. I explained to my mother and my older brother what happened. My brother ran outside and looked up and down the street. I was shaking, absolutely consumed by terror. My emotions finally got the best of me, and I could no longer hold back my tears. We called the police, and they came and searched the area. They asked me if I'd gotten a tag number. Unfortunately, I had to tell the officers that it was too dark to see. I did notice a sticker of some sort of bird on the backseat driver's window. It didn't dawn on me until right then that that had been the same SUV that was parked across the street when I was with my boyfriend nearly an hour prior. They told me they'd checked the army base nearby and the surrounding area, but nobody had seen any vehicle matching the description I gave. All I could think about was what the bus driver had said to me and the irony of what took place on the same night. Years went by, and I didn't think much about that incident after that night. One day, I was scrolling through Facebook when I came across a picture. My friend had posted it. It was a story of a man who had been following her home from work for the past three days. It was the same guy I'd encountered five years prior. My heart felt like it was going to leap out of my throat looking at that post. I noticed that several other women had come forward and they all shared similar experiences to mine. I ended up finding out that he almost kidnapped a 13-year-old girl. She allowed herself to be lured into his car, but once inside she noticed a roll of duct tape, some rope, a pair of gloves, and a bottle of what turned out to be chloroform on the floorboard. She ended up jumping out the window while they were stopped at a red light. I don't know all the details, but apparently he also got physical with a woman who was pregnant and tried to force her into his car. He got pretty ballsy and started trying to abduct women in broad daylight. The news found out his name was Leo, and it was discovered he had a wife and two daughters who were around three and five. They interviewed his neighbors, and to my surprise they defended him, saying that all these women were just lying. It's truly unbelievable how stupid and useless people are. Five separate accounts from five different people who have no connection with each other came forward and shared their experiences. Could you please dislodge your head from your ass and face up to the facts? Anyway, to this day, I have no idea whatsoever became of him. The last I heard, he was still at large. I hope they caught him so no other young woman had to be subjected to this monster ever again. I, 30 and female, used to live in a small neighborhood from ages 13 to 18. This took place when I was around 15 or so. I spent most of my time just walking around the neighborhood, listening to my MP3 player. Sheesh, I feel old just typing that. There was a guy around the same age as me that lived maybe five or so houses down from me. From neighborhood gossip, I learned that he was homeschooled and had been in and out of juvie multiple times due to anger issues. He was almost always outside, and sometimes when I passed by his house he would start following me. I was always smart enough to have my music down low enough to be able to hear and be aware of my surroundings. At first I just passed it off as him ending up taking a walk at the same time of day I did. Looking back, that was truly dumb. 
As time passed by, he got closer and closer to me when following until he eventually decided to come up right behind me. He said some truly heinous things that I will not repeat here. He was basically right in my ear whispering. I ran home immediately and told my sister, who basically had raised me as her own. She told me I was lying and to stop making up stories. For a while, I stopped going out walking unless I needed fresh air and exercise. I tried going regularly again after maybe two months or so. Sure enough, there he was. He came up right behind me and started to say those awful things again. I turned up my music and ignored him. This is what I continued to do every day, until he eventually got tired of me ignoring him, I guess. One day he grabbed my arm, and I couldn't get away. He then grabbed the back of my neck and told me I should know better than to ignore him. Again, I tried telling my sister, but she still didn't believe me. I stopped going out once again. Two weeks later, I woke up to some loud banging on my bedroom wall. There was a garage on both sides of the house, and the wall of my bedroom shared a wall with one of the garages. The garage was unfinished. There wasn't even concrete down. It was easily accessible from outside, as it was missing the door at the back of the house. My sister was out of town, and my dad was deaf and bedridden. It was just me in the house able to do anything. My bedroom also had a door to go outside, so I ran over and made sure it was locked. I laid down and waited for the banging to stop, but it didn't. My cousin and her boyfriend lived just down the street, so I called her up. She sent her boyfriend down to see what was going on. Her boyfriend pulled right into the backyard and right up to the door of the garage. His headlights filled the garage with light and out ran the guy from down the street, holding a large knife. He took off running and my cousin's boyfriend followed close behind. It was at this time I called the police. They came and took a statement, but they said there was nothing they could do because other than going into the garage and trespassing, he hadn't technically done anything. I never took a walk in that neighborhood again. I still wonder how he knew what ball to bang on. How did he know I was right on the other side of it? How did he know my sister was gone or that my dad was bedridden inside and couldn't do anything? I never usually locked that door, so had he been in my house to know? What would have happened if I would have gone outside? It still gives me the creeps. Hello everyone, my name is Jade and I'm 21 years old. I'm going to tell you a story that happened in 2017, back when I was 16 years old. I went on a vacation with my little sister Alice and her best friend Tia, both 14 years old. Like every summer, we usually go to Karnak, a town in Brittany, where we stay in the same residence each time. It belonged to a friend of our father. The residence in question is made up of several small houses with a shared swimming pool. There's no pedestrian entrance to the residence. In other words, the entrance for cars and pedestrians is the same. And since there's no badge or anything, the residence is constantly open to facilitate passage. The gardens of the houses are also designed in the same way. They're not closed and anyone can pass through their neighbor's garden something which is done quite often and which shocks no one really. Our house is right next to a driveway and really close to the pool, which increases the chance of people passing through or by our garden. This misadventure began at the beach. We wouldn't know until a few days later because at the time we didn't really pay attention to what was happening. With Alice and Tia, we always did everything together and as the beach was less than five minutes away and the city center less than ten, we were never accompanied by adults and had a certain amount of freedom. It was right in the middle of a conversation between us girls on the beach when I received an airdrop. I could see a photo of someone's feet. At first, I didn't pay attention at all to the name that airdropped me. I found it funny and decided to accept the photo. 
The photo was a picture of someone's feet in the sand, with writing that said, You're going to die. I laughed and leaned towards Alice and Tia. Ha <laughs> ha, very funny. At the time, we didn't really understand the joke, so we skipped over it and continued our conversation normally. Nothing unusual happened thereafter, until the following afternoon. We went to the beach again and received that same photo of someone's feet, with the words, you're going to die. The joke no longer made me laugh, and I told Alice and Tia to stop doing this, because it was funny once, but not twice. This was the first time I actually showed them the photo. They looked shocked and said it wasn't them who'd airdropped it. I didn't believe them. We returned home and the evening came. All three of us sleep in the same room, by the way. I usually go to bed later than the other two, because I watch movies until late at night on my phone. While the girls were sleeping, I was interrupted in my film by an airdrop request. I then had two thoughts. The first thought was that now that I was looking at the name of the iPhone that sent me the photo, it was quite strange. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was an assembly of letters and symbols that didn't really mean anything. The second was that since Tia and Alice were already asleep, it wasn't possible it was them. At this point, I started to panic because that meant that from the beginning, an outside person had been sending me airdrops and had now followed us to our house. I decided to wake the girls up and let them know something was going on. We were stressed together, but too scared to check to see if anyone was outside. The rest of the night passed, and several days went by without anything further happening. We thought it was a bad joke from some children in the residence and quickly forgot about this happening. A week later, the day before our departure, we decided to visit the abandoned house which was located a stone's throw away from ours, just to mark the occasion before leaving. Our mother had strictly forbidden us from going to this place, because she had clearly seen our look when we saw the house a few days earlier. Abandoned house means a house that's not maintained, and therefore there are many risks, such as the floor collapsing. We were young and didn't care. All we wanted was to have a little scare and some fun. I would like to point out that we had all really forgotten this airdrop story, because since the one sent to the room, I had not received anything further. We arrived at the forbidden abode and entered the home. The door must have already been forced open by someone before, because it was easily opened. We decided to sneak out during the night. An abandoned house must be visited during the evening to make it scarier after all. Once we got inside, we got the feeling a horror film could really be made inside this house. There were debris everywhere, lots of dust, graffiti on the walls, the wood was creaking ominously. We had our dose of stress, and we scared ourselves. At some point though, we heard a noise that didn't sound at all like cracking wood, or a noise you might hear in an old home. The noise was a shrill noise, kind of like the sound of metal scraping against something. We started to look for where the noise was coming from, but with no success. In the next moment, we received a request for an airdrop. We immediately noticed the name of that same iPhone that had sent me those ones a week earlier. This time though, the picture was not a photo of someone's feet in the sand. We decided not to accept the airdrop, but we could still see part of the photo sent. Even if the photo was dark, we could see ourselves inside the house. The photo appeared to be taken from outside, only a few feet away. At this point, we really started to panic. We said to ourselves that maybe this person really was serious. Maybe they were going to hurt us. We automatically moved toward the window, where the photo was seen to be taken from. We could see a shadow outside, which was located almost perfectly from where the noise seemed to be coming from. We wondered what was going on and stood there looking at this thing for a few minutes. It was so dark though that we couldn't really see well. Suddenly, the silhouette changed shape. It was indeed a man, now getting up from what seemed to be a crouching position with what seemed to be a knife. He was scraping it against the post next to him. That was the source of the noise. 
We were sure now. It was this stranger who had been sending us the airdrops all along, because there was no one else around. It didn't stop there, though. He suddenly began to run at us. At this precise moment, we decided to quickly flee from the house. We knew that if we came face to face with this stranger, something bad was going to happen. Luckily, the back door was also open. We wouldn't have had time to run away and escape from the man if we'd had to go through the front door. We ran with all our strength, without looking back, and we arrived at the residence. Once we arrived, we noticed that we could no longer hear the stranger following us, but we did hear a laugh quite far away from us, which really made us shiver. He was stopped in the middle of the road. He pointed at us and laughed, then turned around and left. We hurried back into the house, and we finally realized what just happened. We said to ourselves that we'd likely just escaped the worst-case scenario. We never told our parents our story. We were forbidden from going into the house, and we were afraid of the repercussions. The same goes for the police. We knew full well we had no right to go into this house which was not our property, and therefore we kept silent in fear of getting in trouble. That night, we didn't sleep until early in the morning. Since then, I've left my airdrop to contacts only. I get a strange feeling still whenever I receive one from one of my friends. After thinking about it, we think this person must have been following us for a while, since he'd probably managed to hear our first names in the conversation, to be able to send it to me each time in person. So I've been a huge fan of these types of stories for years now, and finally have a fitting one of my own. For a quick bit of backstory, myself, my brother, and disabled mother all lived together in a trailer about 30 minutes from Nashville, Tennessee. I was wary of moving there at first, for the stereotypes you may hear about trailer parks. Luckily though, it was not nearly as bad as we'd been led to believe. We had zero issues in the last 10 years we've been here. All the neighbors are very nice, well-kept yards, everything else is okay. On to the story though. About a week ago, we were finally putting up our Christmas tree, drinking probably a little bit too much beer, and listening to Christmas music. The Christmas spirit was really in full swing. During our random banter though, my brother suddenly said, Oh yeah, I can't believe I forgot to tell you. Earlier today at work, the owner had to kick out some guy who was acting really creepy. My brother works as the stalker at a family-owned little market, about a mile from our home. He went on to tell me this younger-looking guy was pacing the aisles, sometimes standing still for minutes, and not responding whenever anyone would ask if he needed help finding something. After about 20 minutes of this suspicious behavior, the owner finally asked him to just leave because he was scaring the other customers. Without a single word, the man left. We continued with our good time, hanging ornaments, drinking, getting our mom involved. It was all good. We wrapped up at around 10.30 and helped our mom to bed. We decided we might as well finish off the ton of beer we had left and admire our fully decked out Christmas tree. Around 11.30, we decided to go out on the front porch to share a cigarette, as we usually did when we had a good buzz going. My brother opened the door and almost immediately shut it back closed. I asked him what was wrong. Holy shit, that guy was just telling you about? He just walked down the street. He was out walking right past our house. I thought that was pretty strange, but I wasn't really that concerned. We waited for a few minutes to see if we'd see him again, but when he didn't appear, we went outside and smoked as usual. We went back inside after we were done. My brother and I aren't troublemakers at all, but I am pretty confident in our ability to defend ourselves if we had to. At this point, these were just thoughts in the back of my mind though. After all, I hadn't even seen the guy yet, and he didn't seem to be sticking around. Fast forward to about 2 a.m. We were more than drunk enough to go ahead and call in the night. After one more cigarette, 
my brother opened the door. Immediately, I could hear him saying, Whoa, 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 hey man, you good? Hey buddy, what's up, you good? I was in the kitchen at the time, but quickly decided something didn't sound right. I rushed over to the door, and what I saw when I got to it was a younger man standing on our deck. He was pretty tall, about six foot four. I was realizing for the first time this must be the guy he'd been talking about. One thing my brother must not have gotten close enough to notice at work earlier, though, was this guy's eyes. I'm not exaggerating when I say I've never seen anything like it. His body language wasn't super menacing or anything, but his eyes were the strangest combination of wide-eyed bewilderment and pure fury, like us opening our door confused him and also made him extremely angry. I joined my brother in explaining to him that it's late and he should head home. After what I'd said, there was about 30 seconds of the man just staring. He walked off without a word. I peeked out our blinds to make sure he'd really left, and I couldn't see him anywhere. It was like he'd almost disappeared. We were joking and saying things like, well, that was pretty weird, huh? It took a while for my adrenaline to calm down. I kept thinking to myself that what really bothered me was those 30 seconds of the man staring. It felt like he was deciding on what his next move should be, but what that could have been I have no idea. I also didn't love that my brother said when he opened the door, the man had already been silently standing there. For how long, who can know? We calmed down by watching YouTube videos. After another 30 minutes or so, I finally said to my brother, Okay man, let's just go to bed. I'll take one more look outside to be safe. I felt like it wasn't really necessary, but I opened the door anyway. To my surprise, the man was back. The streetlights are spaced very far apart in our trailer park, but at the very edge of our driveway, I could see his silhouette about 50 feet away, just staring at our front door. I should mention he's not there texting or on the phone with someone or doing anything else. He's just there standing and staring. I do feel a little bad in hindsight because I'm sure this poor guy had some serious mental issues occurring. But between being drunk and exhausted and the furious looks he was giving us, I was over it. I put some bass in my voice. Hey man, you can't just keep coming back to our driveway. You're being creepy. Just leave us alone. I didn't really want to call the cops on him. His demeanor didn't change at all. But the second I mentioned the word cops, that seemed to do the trick. He turned around and walked away. I hope we handled it well. I understand and empathize with people with mental health problems. And I have family and friends who unfortunately suffer from such things. However, I can't shake the feeling that something bad was going to happen that night. He'd never actually left our porch earlier. He didn't leave the porch earlier that night until I showed up to the door, essentially making him outnumbered, and even then he still came back. I hope he's okay out there. We haven't seen the guy since. I also hope not calling the police wasn't a bad choice, and he isn't out there with bad intentions on someone else's front porch at 2am. I wish I could figure out what that was all about, but during every interaction my brother and I had with him that day and night, he never spoke a single word. I used to have a Costco membership, but I had to cancel it after what was one of the most creepy experiences of my life. It started last summer. I would shop at Costco every single week. I had a routine that I would go every Saturday morning and buy all of my items for the week ahead. I would usually get most of the same items. Most of it was food and things like that. It would usually take me less than 30 minutes to get it all done. The membership saved me a lot of money because I used it so frequently. Plus, there was a Costco just over 5 minutes away from my house. One time, I went to Costco like any other day, then returned back home. Everything was fine when later in the day I got the mail. I lived in a small but nice house, in a pretty typical neighborhood. When I retrieved my mail, most of it was just bills and advertisements. 
but I had this one letter that really stood out from the rest. It was typed, but seemed like an actual letter. It wasn't professional looking or anything, and there was no return address either. It didn't say who it was from. It did say, please read. When I opened it up, it was a typed out letter on one piece of paper, directly to me. Hi there, you're such a beautiful woman. I love watching you shop every week at Costco. I'm writing you this because I want to meet you sometime soon. After I read this, I thought to myself, is somebody stalking me or is this just a joke? I didn't really know what to think. I had never noticed anybody following me around Costco or anything. I never went when it was all that busy either, so I thought I would have easily noticed if someone was. Usually it would be around 10am or so, when the store was still really quiet. I considered not going to Costco the next week. Ultimately though, I chose to go. I wanted to save money, and I figured that it was not really that serious. The next Saturday came and I went back to Costco at my usual time. It opened at 9.30 and I would get there at about 10 and be done by 10.30. I started doing all my normal shopping, going down all the aisles I typically did, getting all the products I usually did. I was careful to pay attention if someone was following me or not, but I didn't notice anyone suspicious around. About halfway through, I was in one of the aisles toward the back of the store. On each side of the aisle were lots of pallets on the ground. There would be products on the pallets that you could buy. If you've never been to Costco before, you can buy things in bulk, and the store is kind of like a giant warehouse. Most of the products are not displayed the way they are at Target or Walmart or something like that. I was shopping when, for whatever reason, I found my vision drawn to the right, where these pallets of products were. Behind a stack of pallets, I saw a man hiding back there. He was far back and hidden really well. He was also staring right at me. When I saw him, he immediately ducked down out of sight. I walked away and immediately went to the checkout. This guy had to be the one who'd written me that letter. I did not get a great look at him, but he seemed to be in his 20s and had darker hair. When I got to the checkout, I told the employee at the register about him. She said she would talk to her manager about it. I just wanted to leave though. I figured the guy would probably leave or hide before they got there anyway. I left and the same day I cancelled my Costco membership. There was no way I could go back there. This really creeped me out because apparently unbeknownst to me, some guy had been watching me every time I shopped. I had no idea because he was hiding in the aisles behind pallets. It must have been just about every time. Later that night I was at home by myself and got a knock at the door at about 8pm or so. I got up and went to the window. I looked outside and it was the very same guy who had been hiding in the Costco. My heart started racing. He knocked again after I didn't answer the door right away. I stayed in the living room. I just wanted him to leave. After about five minutes, he knocked once more. I was still not going to answer. I stayed where I was, and after a little while, I thought he'd finally left. That was until I heard a knock coming from the back side of my house. He was now at the back door. This was creeping me out too much. I called the police on him. He wasn't trying to break in, but he was certainly trying very hard to get me to answer. I didn't know what he was going to do if I continued to ignore him for a long time. I think then he actually left though. When the police got there, they looked around outside and couldn't find the guy anywhere. They said if he came back for me to not hesitate to call. For the rest of the night though, he didn't try anything else. I didn't see him for several days and was not going back to Costco either. Later that week, I got another letter from him. This letter was a little bit longer than the first one. It said that he was disappointed I didn't want to talk to him and even more disappointed that I'd called the police on him. He then said that he was sorry and he was not going to bother me anymore. I was actually really surprised to read that. The crazy thing is that after that letter, I really haven't seen from him or heard from him ever since. It's amazing how he just stopped. 
after going to such great lengths. I mean, he found out where I lived, he watched me while hiding inside of Costco. I guess he had enough common sense to know that if I got the police involved, he might get in some serious trouble, and it meant he was really scaring me. Either way, I'm glad I haven't seen him since, and I hope I never see him ever again. This happened to me when I was at elementary school. It would usually take me about 30 minutes to walk home from school. On the way home, there were two sets of traffic lights on a big two-lane road. My school was by the seaside. I loved it. I used to walk in a group of close friends of about three or four of us, and we used to chat about all the latest fads, fashion, homework, that sort of thing. It was a really fun time for me when I think back on it. It was summertime in my third year of elementary school. As usual, I was waiting for my friends outside on the playground after school had finished. I noticed an old man in a white car kind of eyeing me through his open window. At first, I thought he was someone's child because he was so short and petite. He was also sunken back in his seat so I could barely see him. Not to mention, he had this baseball cap pulled down just over his eyes. I remember the logo that was on his cap. His skin was slightly sunburned, too. On a second glance, he looked to be about 40 to 50 years old. The man fully rolled down his window and leaned over the passenger seat. He called out to me. Hey, I'm sorry to tell you, but your dad's been involved in a big accident. He was rushed to the hospital. I'm one of your dad's friends, and I'm here to take you to go see him. Of course, when you hear something that terrible, it's gonna shock you. I had never seen this old man before, though. When you're younger and an adult tells you to get in a car, you listen, right? Especially when they say something like that. I didn't know what to do. What was I supposed to do right now? My legs were frozen still. It was at this point one of my friends came around the corner, and I began to tell her about what I'd just heard from this old man in the car. Our conversation was interrupted. Hurry up, your dad's waiting for you! The old man in the white car seemed to be getting very impatient. He said once again my dad had asked him to come and get me. These words really upset me. I didn't know this man, but I was so worried about my dad. I was so confused. Something in my gut was telling me this was a very dangerous situation. This standoff between us and the old man in the car went on for about 10 minutes. It was agonizing until he finally got fed up. Fine, don't get in. I hope your dad forgives you if he doesn't die. He rolled up the window and started the car. He drove off and I watched that car driving away. I had conflicting feelings of guilt for not accepting the ride with him to see my father in the hospital. Yet most strongly, I felt it would not have been safe to do so. After a while, my friend and I decided to head home as usual. I was nervous all the way back. As we walked along the seafront, I got home and spoke to my mother about what just happened. She confirmed that the old man was a liar. She reported the incident to my school and to the police. She looked me dead in the eyes and said, I'm so glad you didn't get in that man's car. The next day at school, all the students were gathered and given a warning about this strange old man. They were told about what happened to me. The teacher explained that if we saw an older man wearing a cap in a white car, that we had to tell a teacher or a family member immediately. Do not believe anything the man said, and get away from him as fast as possible. I found out at a later date that a child had actually gone missing at a school not too far away from ours, and the child's whereabouts are unknown. It was said the child had been tricked into getting into a stranger's car, and the police were currently conducting an investigation. I don't know how that case ended, but I pray the child was returned safely and the perpetrator was put away for a long time. I wonder what would have happened to me if I had gotten into that car. I'm much older now, but I do think about this often, and when I do, I always break out in goosebumps.
A few weeks ago, I went on a trip where I'd rented out an Airbnb townhouse. I was staying in a small town that was near some trails that I really wanted to hike. I'd never been there before, nor did I really have any idea of the place I was staying at. I just knew it was a relatively small town that was in a convenient area for me to drive. The way down there took nine hours in total, so by the time I got to the Airbnb, it was getting quite late. It was on a street that had multiple other townhouses on it, but once I found it, I parked on the road and got my things up to the door. The place looked decent on the outside, definitely not new or anything, but nothing that I wasn't already expecting. I texted the owner to let them know I'd made it, since I didn't see a passcode to the door anywhere in my emails. I waited for a couple of minutes, just kind of standing there and looking out at the street. I heard a door open nearby, and a man walked around the corner with this big smile on his face. He greeted me as the Airbnb host, and then let me into the place. He said he'd be right next door if I needed anything. I wasn't expecting that, but at least he left quickly and didn't make anything too weird. I set my things up in the bedroom and had a look around the house. I went to bed soon after. The next day, I ate a quick breakfast, then drove out to a trail and hiked it for a good four hours or so. I got back to the townhouse at 7 p.m., but when I entered this time, something felt different. Some of the things in my room were off, like they'd been moved slightly, almost imperceptible. Nothing that I know of was missing. But I don't know, I just had a feeling it had been tampered with. Aside from my unevident suspicions, though, there wasn't really anything suspicious to prove anyone had been inside while I was gone. After looking around for 30 minutes, I was more sure that this was just me being nervous about staying in an unfamiliar area. I forgot about it and heated up a frozen meal, then ate dinner on the couch. At around 11pm, I went to bed. This was a single-story townhouse, so the bedroom was at the end of the main hallway, just opposite the front door. I was always used to sleeping upstairs, so it was a little hard to get comfortable as I laid there in bed and tried to fall asleep. I kept drifting off for a few minutes, then waking up again and repeating this process. Maybe an hour into the night, I was laying there awake waiting to go back asleep when I heard a sound from outside the room. It sounded like a door softly creaking open from across the house. It sounded intentional, like they were trying to open it as quietly as possible. I sat up in my bed and looked at the door. I listened in, but I didn't hear anything else. After a minute, I got up and went to the bedroom door, cracking it open just enough to see through down the hallway. I could see the dim glow of the porch light lighting up the area where the front door was. That indicated to me that the front door was now partially open. I carefully and quietly closed my door, then locked it and moved to the back of the room. I called the police as well. In the middle of the phone call, I heard a creak right outside the bedroom door. When I looked at the bottom, I could see the outline of a shadow of someone standing there. I immediately stopped talking, waiting for them to walk away before continuing to report to the operator. Thankfully, nothing else seemed to happen. I waited for the officers to get there, but the person was already long gone by then. Everything showed that someone had been inside, including shoe prints all over the place. There was no doubt, even to the cops. For some reason, I had my mind set on it being that Airbnb host. They didn't find anything to support that, other than the front door having been opened without any struggle. There's also not much to say on whether they'd been inside the house while I was gone during the day. At least, not with nothing missing. Since they came back only once I was there, I think their intentions must have had something to do with me. It still haunts my thoughts, wondering what could have happened, and if that person is out there still trying. My name is Daryl. Many years ago, I used to work night shift at a hotel in Myrtle Beach, 
South Carolina, mostly just families and stuff. We had on-site security then, too. However, in the off-season during the winter months, it was a completely different story. The cheap weekly rates that we'd offer attracted a lot of creepy people. The idea was supposed to make money in the off-season by renting to what's known as snowbirds, old retired people who come to the beach for a month or more throughout the winter. It didn't always work out that way, though. The cheap rates made it possible for less than desirable elements to become long-term residents. I'd discovered more than my fair share of meth labs, broken up physical assaults, and done much more during the winter months working third shift. I would meet some interesting people quite often. The cold weather would mean some homeless people would come in and try to get warm and grab a cup of free coffee. I wasn't technically supposed to let them, but it's not in me to be cruel. I would let them grab a cup of coffee and get warm for a minute, as long as they didn't attempt to cause any trouble. As you can see, the night shift in winter made for some crazy and sometimes creepy stories. I have quite a lot, but this one stands out the most to me, because it didn't end well for me. I had a great night up till this point. I had gone up to an indie wrestling show with my best friend before work. In fact, I had agreed to come in an hour early the next night for the young lady that worked the second shift. In exchange for her working an hour late for me on this night, you know, so I could enjoy the wrestling show. Ironically enough, I even met Terry Funk that night, a wrestling legend known for his hardcore and bloody matches. Little did I know I was about to experience that kind of violence for real. I was supposed to be there at midnight, due to her working over an hour for me. I normally came in at 11pm. I counted the register and she briefed me on her night shift as to what had happened, per usual. As she was leaving, my friend who will call Andrew pulled up. He worked second shift maintenance at this hotel, and two other hotels our company owned. He would regularly stop by after work and go grab us some food. We would play World of Warcraft on our laptops after eating. Business was usually slow enough for this to happen. He was just getting my money in order to order food and getting ready to leave. I was excitedly telling him about how much fun I'd had during the wrestling show and I was showing him my Terry Funk t-shirt that I was so proud of. I was walking into the back office to put the shirt up when I heard the doorbell indicating a customer had entered. I turned around when I heard someone say something loudly. I still couldn't make out what they had said. I just reached the doorway when I saw Andrew just fall down in front of me. The next thing I know, a guy walks around the corner and hits me in the head with a short steel pipe in his hand. It staggered me, and I went to one knee. The next thing I know, he was hitting me in the head with the pipe over and over. I heard another guy who I hadn't noticed at this moment say, He got away and got a cop. They left out the door. I was finally able to get to my feet. I tried to call the police from the phone in the back office, but I was having issues. I slammed it in frustration. I was really hurting, and I was scared. I was freaking out. I realized they could come back at any moment. I ran and locked the door. I didn't know where Andrew had gone, and that worried me. I called 911. About this time, blood had started pouring down my head. I told the operator I'd been attacked, and I needed an officer and an ambulance right away. I then called the other hotel we ran to let the night manager named Travis, who watched over all three properties, know what happened. He thought I was messing with him at first, because when we get bored we would often prank each other. I finally convinced him I wasn't joking. He was going to lock up and calm down. He was going to lock up and calm down. The cops and the ambulance pulled up, and I opened the door. It was at this time I found out that after they'd sucker punched him and knocked him down, Andrew was able to jump over the desk and escape, just as a cop was driving by. I ended up in the hospital ER, where I had to have ten staples in my scalp. They gave me morphine for the pain. I had no way to get home after being treated, but the doctors and nurses took pity on me and paid for a cab. My plan was to just go back to work, 
because this was December and Christmas was coming. I had three kids and I needed all the hours I could get. When I got back to the hotel, this guy Ted was there with his wife Barbara, who also worked at the front desk. She was shocked to see me. She thought I would still be in the hospital. I thought that I'd only been hit once in the head after being punched, but the video which Ted was pulling for the police showed a different story. After I went to one knee, the guy had hit me not just one time in the head, but instead a total of ten times. I kept trying to grab the pipe and get up for some reason. I don't remember that. I guess I was really out of it. He kept punching me and hitting me with the pipe until his friends told him that Andrew had gotten away. That's when the two of them ran out. I was given a room at the other hotel we own, and Ted and Barbara gave me a lift there. I was in no condition to drive. They gave me a paid week off to heal. They then switched me to the other hotel on night shift for about a month, just in case these guys were after me in particular. We never found out why they chose to attack me. So back in 2008, when I was still just the age of 20 years young, I got my first ever real job as a pub barback in an area of Nottingham called Trent Bridge. My living situation with my parents over in Lenton wasn't great. They were in the middle of a divorce, and the house just sort of had this black cloud hanging over it all the time. First chance I got, I moved into a small bed sit on Bunbury Street, which was much closer to the pub I worked at. It was a really crap time in my life, to be honest, but moving into that bed sit was a massive highlight and a huge boost when I needed it most. It wasn't much, but at least it was mine, and it was a huge weight off my shoulders to have somewhere I could retreat to, to get some mates over, to have a few vodka and Red Bulls, just forget about all the stuff going on in my life. The wallpaper was peeling and one of the windows was stuck, but I didn't really mind the little things like that much. What I did mind with a group of lads who used to hang out around the bus stop on Bathley Street until all hours of the morning. I first noticed them a few days after I moved in because of where my bed sit was situated. Apparently, this area was a training center for Nottingham's bus drivers. One of my windows looked over Bathley Street, where the bus stop was. I came home from work at about midnight and had just crept into my room as quiet as a mouse. I could hear some raucous laughter coming from across the street. I looked out my window, and there they were, a group of young lads in their late teens and early twenties, taking shelter under the bus stop. At first, I thought they were just waiting for the last bus, but after many hours came by and went, they were still hanging around being loud. At that time, I was planning on going to bed, but I realized they were just using the place as a kind of a hangout spot, presumably to keep out of the rain that night. They weren't so bad and moved on not long after I'd gotten into bed, but on other nights, they were just a downright nuisance. They'd be out there screaming and laughing until 4 or 5 in the morning. It had to be absolutely dire weather out to ensure they gave it a miss. There was a brief break over Christmas, but as soon as it started to warm up again, they'd come back every night without fail. The only times they ever moved on involuntarily was when someone called the police on them. I actually saw that happen once, but the ones that had anything naughty on them legged it, and the others just mouthed off to the police while they emptied their pockets, then tossed their little blue stop and search papers on the floor. After a while, I think the police just decided to give up on it. When the lads were at the bus stop, people tended to avoid it and just use an alternative. They were a right pain in the ass, but aside from smoking the odd spliff on the bus stop and being obnoxious, I didn't actually think they were doing anything illegal. There wasn't much the cops could really do about it anyway. This goes on from winter to spring, and once it started warming up a bit, the lads started hanging around the bus stop again. This wasn't much of a problem before, because my late shift pattern meant I didn't get to bed until the same time they did, roughly speaking. But once I started taking days too, 
that all changed. The non-stop racket they made really started to mess with my sleep. It took earplugs and ambient music in order for me to be able to get any decent sleep. On more than one occasion, I'd open my eyes to see blue lights flashing through the blinds. I'd take an unhealthy amount of satisfaction when I saw one or two of the noisemakers getting arrested for whatever it is they had found in their pockets. For some reason, even that didn't deter them, though. I don't know what they were thinking, honestly. If that was me, I'd have just found another spot where I couldn't get harassed by the police so much. I remember thinking there must have been some reason they insisted on being there. Maybe they'd been told to be there by someone who had a vested interest in knowing if the police were driving down Bathley Street and considering what happened next. I think that really might have been the case. Every so often, it wasn't a marked police car that rolled up on the lands of the bus stop. It was an unmarked vehicle. Some normal-looking Vauxhall Corso would roll up right next to them. Some cop would jump out and they'd all try and sort of scamper about to do their usual gob off. One night, I was up playing Grand Theft Auto, which had just come out that very week. I happened to spot the lads at the bus stop while I was on the way back from a toilet break. I lingered for a second and gave them a very disapproving look. I knew they were going to be keeping me awake later on that night. Then, as I was watching them, the unmarked car slowed down as it came up to them, then stopped about 10 or 20 feet down. I was thinking, yep, there's the police again. The police normally would have jumped out and started chasing people down. Whoever this was was just happy to idle a few meters down the road. The guys at the bus stop obviously thought it was the police too. I think only one of them ran away. That must have been the one who had the ganja on them. Instead of running, the rest stayed put and started shouting things at the idling car. I was well up for a bit of street theater, so I stared out the window, grinning to myself, hoping their swift dispersal was going to result in a nice and quiet night for me. The scene before me suddenly changed. I was looking at the dark, unmarked car, thinking, hurry up and do something, and then they did. There was a flash, then a bang. One of the lads at the bus stop just folded. I really do mean he folded, like a piece of paper. His head at his knees before his body hit the floor. It was one of the single most scary things I've ever seen in my life. That night, I learned that no matter how many Tarantino movies you watch or first-person shooters you play, there's nothing that can prepare you for seeing someone get gunned down with your very own eyes. Looking back, the gunshot must have severed the poor kid's spine above the waist. That accounted for the weird way in which he fell. I realized what I'd seen as I ducked down below the window and took cover behind the brick wall beneath. I know that must sound melodramatic, as no one was shooting at me, but I did worry there might have been a wild return of fire or something from the lads there. They apparently ran away. I'd never seen or experienced anything remotely like that before, and I didn't know what to do. Instead of hearing any more gunshots, all I heard was the sound of the dark hatchback burning rubber as it sped off into the night. The sound of that gunshot was as loud as a firework, and seeing as this was the end of April, with no reason to be shooting those off, I'm almost certain other people in the neighborhood heard it as well, and were just as concerned as I was. I didn't know what else to do. The only thing I really did know was the poor lad outside must need help. He must have been in real pain. Jesus Christ, no one deserves to die in the street like that all alone, with your friends running away from you. I obviously did a lot of talking to the police after that, both on the phone, then in person, then in person a third time when we went over my statement, and I got asked more questions. The police appealed for more info, but as far as I know, no one was arrested or convicted for it. The general consensus was that it was gang-related, but I don't think the police ever mentioned that, because if they did, who would come forward? It certainly had me in two minds about going to court. As far as I know, the poor lad's murder has remained unsolved, even all these years later. I moved away from Trent Bridge about a year afterward, basically as soon as I had the money and a nice enough flat to do so. No one hung around the bus stop for the rest of that time either. Not even to actually catch the bus. 
Sometimes I'd catch a glimpse of it at night, looking all lonely with no one around it. Each and every time the image of that lad's body and the way it folded replayed in my head. I'm very glad to have moved away from a place with such a horrible memory attached to it. Last New Year's, me and my two best friends decided it would be fun to get together and rent out a house for the night. We weren't big on going to huge parties. We just enjoyed hanging out among our small group. Also, all of us lived in dorm rooms, so having a house to ourselves for once sounded like a great time, even without any partying going on. My friend Jason rented out an Airbnb, on the outskirts of the town we were in. I carpooled with my other friend Christian, and we met Jason there on New Year's Eve, sometime around noon or so. This place was more of a cabin than a normal house, being made all out of wood, and having typical cabin features. There were other similar looking cabin houses around, but they all had a decent spacing between them, so it sort of felt like we were out there all alone. The inside wasn't as great, but this was one of the cheaper places available, so none of us were expecting the lap of luxury. We spent the day just hanging out in the living room and talking about various things. At around six or so, Christian went out to the store to grab some snacks and drinks. During this time, Jason and I were still sitting in the living room when there was a knock at the door. We looked at each other in surprise, knowing it was really weird for anyone to be out here and knocking on the door to an Airbnb. I got up and looked out the peephole, seeing some random guy just standing on the doorstep. I noticed the door had one of those metal latches on it, so I flipped it over and opened the door just enough to see them. I wouldn't usually answer the door to a random guy, but being in someone else's house, I wasn't sure if maybe they were looking for the host or something. This guy looked at me, and I was instantly aware of his displeased look. He seemed quite angry about something, and it became more blunt when he opened his mouth and told me in a disrespectful and stubborn tone that we needed to be quiet tonight and not disturb the whole neighborhood. The way he said it was almost threatening, as if we'd been making a ton of noise, but we hadn't done anything loud, nor were we planning to do so. All the houses were so far apart anyway, that even if he was a neighbor, there's no possible way he'd hear anything. It's not like we were shooting up huge fireworks or something. I really wasn't in the mood to argue with this guy, so I said sure and closed the door in his face. Not even a second later, he began banging on the door once again. I ignored him at that time, making a face to Jason, like this guy was crazy. We heard him leave after a moment longer. When Christian got back, we told him about the strange encounter. He almost didn't even believe us. The next three hours went by quickly. He watched a movie, played some games on Jason's Switch. Then, come almost midnight, we heard something outside. It sounded like someone dropping something on the ground. A few seconds later, the piercing sound of glass shattering came from right beside the door. All of us stood up and ran to look out the window. The same guy from earlier was standing by Christian's car, which now had glass covering it from a shattered windshield. The guy was holding a metal baseball bat and looked like he was in a psychotic state, pacing around and going crazy. Christian was pissed, going to the door and storming outside to confront him. Both Jason and I went to stop him, but before we even got to the doorway, a gunshot echoed throughout the cabin. I stopped in place, knowing what had likely happened, but it almost felt like a miracle when I saw Christian sprint back inside and lock the door. Behind him, a few more shots went off, hitting the side of the cabin, followed by the man swinging the bat against the front door. Just as suddenly as it all started, the man just ran away. After an investigation, it was found that he wasn't even one of the neighbors of the Airbnb. Nobody seemed to know who he was or where he lived. 
They also had no idea why he went so absolutely insane. It was just an incredibly dangerous and unpredictable encounter that almost took our lives. This happened almost a year ago. It was around November of last year, and I was going on a trip to Istanbul, Turkey. Before that, I want to mention that I'm male and from the US. I've been traveling to certain countries since the last, say, maybe around five to six years. I normally go to other countries to observe certain cultures and all that stuff. Normally, I travel with my friend who I'll call Alex. Alex and I go to these countries, mostly around Asia, but one trip was not anything good. I told my mom I was going to Istanbul that time, along with Alex. I went to take a flight there. I'm pretty sure it was a 17-hour flight. When I arrived, I decided to book a hotel, along with Alex in tow. It was not a cheap hotel. It was around the second day of the trip and I went to Tom Square to a restaurant to eat. I can't remember exactly what restaurant it was. It was a very busy day out. I was still eating when I began to hear something very unusual. It was like a loud thunder type of noise. But it was in the distance and loudly echoing. I saw people starting to scream and beginning to run. Alex, who was shaking in fear beside me, called out to me. Dude, what the fuck was that? What the hell? We heard and saw police cars and ambulances driving by. All of a sudden, there was an explosion. It was apparent a bombing and shooting had occurred. I texted my mom that I was okay, and that Alex and I hadn't been around the scene of the attack. We went back to the US soon after. We watched the videos of the aftermath of the attack. And dear God, it was absolutely horrible. The most horrible thing was to see how many bodies were just laying in the streets. I won't go completely into full detail on what happened, but it was truly traumatizing. I've heard there's been a controversy on who was truly behind the blast. The assailant, as far as we know, was not a man. Surprisingly, it was a woman who was later caught. Alex and I were absolutely thankful that we were not caught in the incident and were not killed in the crossfire. It was absolutely shocking what we witnessed that day, and honestly, I still cannot believe it. One day, while doing my laundry, one of the lights blew out in my basement. My basement is set up so that the laundry room is split from the other side of the basement with a wall and a door. In order to get upstairs, you have to exit the laundry room and go through the separate part of the basement. Since there was only a light on one side now, it was really dark. I finished the laundry I had to do while dreading the walk through the dark basement. I exited the laundry room and got about halfway through the basement area when I heard a loud cackle from the darkness. Imagine the sound someone may make when they try to imitate a witch. Take that and imagine the witch had been smoking for 50 years, making her voice much deeper and hoarser. That's what I heard, clear as day right behind me. I did not look or hesitate. I bolted for the stairs. I waited until my father got home and then changed the light bulb. I have yet to hear that cackle or anything else since, and I've not told a single person in the house about it. Preface with a little backstory. About three years ago, I moved from my old childhood and family house to the new home where we currently live. The move was about 20 minutes away, so not too bad, although I did have to move schools. In the new house, I got a pretty cool room. It has a loft that hangs above my bed and is where I'm typing this right now. It has my computer and record player, but not really much else. Only three people could be up there comfortably. It hangs about half over my bed six feet down. 
Across from my loft and my bed is a large window overlooking the street and the empty property right across it. I never open the curtains or the windows because the direct sunlight is way too bright up there. When we moved here, our next door neighbor was a guy in the neighborhood who built his house as well. When we finally settled in, we hung out with their family for a while. They really opened up to us and told us some stuff about what happened when our house was being built. They said a random dark car with tinted windows would often come by some days and just watch them build for hours on end. If they ever approached the car, it would immediately zoom away. We were concerned but not scared in any way at this point, so not much else came of it and we went about life as usual. A few weeks later, our neighbor had another story to tell us. This time, he freaked himself out just by telling it. He told us that just within the past few nights, things have been going mysteriously missing from his garage. As a builder, he tends to have a lot of tools lying around, so he didn't notice at first. Then bigger things started vanishing, like propane tanks and even a table saw. The final straw and scariest part was when his gun went missing. The gun was not out with the tools, though. It was locked in his basement's gun safe with a security system guarded house. His spouse and kids were away on a trip, so it was only him that was home. The next night, he decided to stay up and see if he could find anything. He said that same car that had watched him build our house pulled up to his home around 3 a.m. that night. A very average-sized man got out, and when my neighbor opened his front door holding a baseball bat, the man just calmly got back in his car and drove away. He said it was almost like the man had been expecting him. At this point, our family was really freaked out, but it didn't stop there. Of course, it wouldn't. A week later, our neighbor called us frantically and told us that outside the entrance to the neighborhood was a duffel bag full of all the small tools the person had taken and the gun as well. There was a note attached that read, I wasn't finished with them. Okay, what the fuck? At this point, we were terrified. So terrified that within the next month, we had a security system installed. Nothing came of these events for the next few months. All of the above happened around last February. That November, of course, it had to escalate again and scare us all. One day, my family and I are outside the house walking the trails of our backyard forest. We own about four acres of land, so it's sometimes nice to just walk back there. I ran ahead and caught up to our dog, who had probably found an animal or something. When I reached him, he was barking past the tree line to where you could barely see anymore. As I peeked over, I noticed a figure, the figure of a man just standing there, staring in our direction. I tried to study this person as quickly as I could, so if this shit ever happened again, I could make sure it was the same guy. It was a man, of normal height and weight. No facial hair, but a notably large nose. No glasses, very short hair, wearing all black jeans and a black jacket. That's all I could get, before he just casually walked away. I ran back to my family to tell them, and to have them come with me. I sure as hell wasn't about to go after this dude by myself, but as we investigated, there was not a single trace of him. The reason I told you about my mom in the beginning sets up the last part of this story. One day in December, very similar to today actually, I was on Reddit and TeamSpeak with some of my friends. All of a sudden, a very silent thud came from my window. Mind you, it was 2 a.m., and everyone in my home was asleep. I went down the ladder of my loft to the window and gingerly peeled back the curtain. I saw the very same man standing across the street in an empty lot. I nearly shit myself. He saw me in the window, and his only response? Walk away backwards slowly into the woods, keeping eye contact with me until he was out of sight. This incident took place in the summer of 2023. Last year, I transferred with my company to take a new position in a major Midwestern city. 
My spouse was still working and living back in California for the next few months. I rented a studio apartment for myself in a newly renovated apartment building in a popular downtown neighborhood, at least until we could look for a place together. The apartment was quite small, but it was also just as nice. It was in a secure building with interior hallways and a nice downstairs lobby. I was one of the first tenants to move to this newly renovated building, and other new residents soon started moving in as well. A major advantage of this move was that I'd only be a couple of hours drive from my hometown and my parents. I started my new job and everything was going pretty great. I was quite enjoying my new neighborhood, and the neighbors in the apartment building generally kept to themselves like I did. Then, a new guy moved in across the hall, and everything changed. We'll call him David. David was a single man in his 60s, and was very different from the college students and young professionals who lived in our building. I started noticing his erratic behavior almost immediately. I would come home from work, only to see him sitting in his car in our small parking lot, just staring off into the distance. We were having issues that summer, with smoke clouds coming over from the vast Canadian wildfires. They were leaving a light dusting of ash on our cars similar to pollen. David was convinced that someone was spraying this dust onto his car specifically and was accusing various tenants he would run into in the parking lot. He would hoard trash in his apartment and leave trash bags in the hallway, causing a foul odor. He would also randomly start yelling at himself in the hallway. After enough time, I finally had enough and complained to the leasing office. The manager was quick to dismiss my concerns, saying she'd been in his apartment and everything was completely fine. In August, my parents' 50th anniversary was coming up, and I was excited to go home and spend a weekend with them. A few days before their anniversary, my boss informed me he would be flying in to work on an important project with me that would have us working throughout the weekend. I was really disappointed and felt like I was letting my parents down. I managed to get away for a quick overnight trip in the middle of the week to go see them though and got back before my boss was due to arrive. I drove down and spent the night with them. The next morning I checked my email as I was getting ready to head back. There was an email from my apartment manager in regard to the incident from the night before. The email was very vague, but it stated a resident had died and there would be further details coming later. My heart sank and I immediately went pale. My mind instinctively went to my strange neighbor, David. I opened up a local news app for my city and the top story was about an axe shooter in my apartment building who was killed during a SWAT team standoff the night before. Apparently, David had approached my next-door neighbor in the hallway with a gun and threatened to shoot him. The neighbor ran back into his apartment and called 911. David also called 911 and told the dispatcher that his neighbors were hacking his phone and if the police didn't come, he was going to kill everyone in the building. The police came and tried to talk with him, but he had barricaded himself in his apartment and was heavily armed. The police and SWAT team soon arrived, and David began firing a rifle out his window at anyone he saw in the parking lot below. All of the neighbors on my floor were trapped in their apartments with no way to escape. They had to hunker down and barricade themselves from his random gunfire. There was another building across the street with a direct line of sight into our apartment building. A police sniper took a position in that building and shot David through his window. Then they flew a drone in through it and confirmed that he was dead, still with gun in hand. Luckily, no one else had been injured. I got home later that day to find a bullet-riddled apartment building and several neighbors who didn't normally even speak to each other, hugging and crying, showing each other videos of the incident from their hiding places. I'd never felt so lucky to have been out of town. If my boss hadn't messed up all my plans, I would have still been home that night. 
I'm sorry that David didn't get the mental health attention he needed, but he put so many lives in danger. I was in my senior year of high school about 10 years ago. I grew up as a sort of outcast. I wasn't bullied or anything, but I also didn't really have any friends. I didn't mind that solitary lifestyle, though. I went through school, then would come home and play video games and lose myself in digital worlds. That was my escape, so to call it. My home life wasn't what I would call bad either. It was just my dad and I, and I loved my dad a lot. He worked so much to provide for me, and when I was young, maybe 10 or 11 years old, my mom got involved with some bad people and their hobbies, if you know what I mean. My dad didn't want to expose me to that world anymore, and we eventually moved away. It was quite messy, but it was for the best. He tried getting her help throughout the years, but she always turned it down. That was all until one day when she just went off the grid completely. It was sad, but we both moved on. And when I got older, he would have to leave for the weekend once a month for his job. I didn't really mind, though. It may seem crazy to people to leave someone at that age home alone for a weekend, but my dad trusted me a lot. One specific weekend during senior year, when my dad had left for the night, I started my normal routine. My pops would leave some money behind in order to order some pizza and some soda. We never had soda in the house normally, so getting a two-liter with the pizza was like a double treat for me. My night was beginning to play out just like every other night I was home alone. I demolished the pizza and drank most of the soda, and after a little breather on the couch, I went to my room and started playing some PlayStation. And that's how I spent most of my weekends, even if my dad was home. I would usually play Call of Duty, but Grand Theft Auto Online had just come out, so I had been spending quite a bit of time playing that. After a few hours of that, I decided to play the single-player story mode. The older I got, I seemed to play the story mode in games less, but for some reason on this night, I wanted to play something with some more substance, even if it was GTA. Since I wasn't playing online anymore, I took my headphones off. As much as I game, I hate wearing headphones for long periods of time. They really hurt my ears, you know. I'd been playing for a little while, when I thought I could hear something coming from downstairs. There weren't any loud or crazy noises, really. It was just these sort of small vibrations and little bumps. Now, I've been home alone a ton of times, and I didn't remember ever feeling any of those vibrations or hearing any small noises like that. At the same time, though, it was such a small noise that it wasn't alarming enough for me to actually freak out. It was a little after one in the morning. I think it's in all our subconsciouses to be a little on edge when you're home alone at that hour. Every few moments, I would hear this little scuffling noise. I paused the game and tried to listen in. When I listened, I would mostly just hear more silence, maybe an occasional little bump or something. Because I was home alone, of course the quick thought of an intruder crossed my mind. I'm embarrassed to say, though, that at some point I thought to myself that ghosts could be causing this. I debated back and forth with myself about this for about 30 minutes. Finally, I paused the game and went over and sat in my computer chair to just listen in fully for a few minutes, without listening to the sound of gameplay or anything else. I noticed that the sounds were happening more regularly now, those little bumps and such. I'd initially blamed it on cracking pipes or house noises, but they started to happen more and more often. The little vibrations I could feel were now happening almost every second. It was like my dad might be downstairs, but the only thing missing was hearing his voice. The thought of my dad coming home early had crossed my mind, but he would have called me, or at least poked his head in the room to see if I was still awake. 
Was I just being paranoid? Was I getting myself all worked up for nothing? I decided I had to go downstairs and check it out to prove to myself that nobody was in the house. Clearly, I was just letting my imagination run away from me. I crept slowly down the upstairs hall and made my way to the top of the staircase. While I was slowly heading in that direction, the muffled sounds were getting much louder and I started to fear the worst. I thought of calling the police. I was too anxious in that moment though. In my mind, I was thinking to myself, what if nobody's there and I waste the police's time? When I got to the bottom of the stairs, I saw a light illuminating the dark walls coming from the other side of the house. The kitchen light was on. It's possible I'd done that myself, but I was fairly certain I had shut the light off before heading upstairs. I was practically crawling my way to the kitchen. I was moving slowly. When I was only a few feet away from the kitchen doorway, I could hear what sounded like someone rummaging through my cabinets. That was accompanied by a soft humming voice. I was half expecting to see some big, burly, scary burglar, but the voice indicated something else entirely. I peeked my head around the corner, when next to the kitchen sink, I saw a very small woman. Her hair was extremely wild, flowing out in every direction. I had my phone in hand ready to call the police. The situation had me frozen in terror, but also incredible curiosity. I realized that this woman was singing Disney songs to herself. I almost fainted right there, because instinctively I knew who this person was. It was my mom. She was singing the same song she would sing to me when I was very young. It was one of the only memories of my mother I actually had left. I couldn't move. I must have been trembling because she heard me. She turned around and a big smile lit up her face. Even though this was my mom, it was not the woman I remembered. Her teeth looked rotten, and her eyes looked like they were sunken into her face. A voice that should have been soothing was now unnerving. There's my baby. What are you doing awake at this hour? I didn't respond. I just stood there like a statue. She came over to me and put her dirty hands on my shoulder. What am I going to do with you? Your father, he's always changing out cabinets. I swear that man doesn't listen. She then started to laugh. But it wasn't charming or calming. It was like she wasn't really there. She turned back around and started humming and started going through the cabinets again. I broke out of my trance and went to my room. I locked the door and called the police. I called my dad, too. My dad made sure I was in the bedroom with the door locked. He didn't give me any details, but he said there was a good chance my mother was dangerous and I needed to be safe just in case. The cops showed up and I heard an altercation start downstairs. I could hear my mom yelling at the police to get out of her house. The police knew the situation from myself and my dad, and I heard a brief struggle, then silence for a few moments. I heard a cop shout my name and tell me it was alright for me to come downstairs. I spoke with the police for a little while as another officer drove my mother away. One officer stayed parked outside my house all night until my dad came home to help me feel safer, which I really did appreciate. He spoke with one of the officers. I could tell by reading my dad's body language that he was uncomfortable and we were potentially fortunate to avoid something horrible happening. My mother actually had two knives on her when she was apprehended. One knife she must have had when she broke in, and the other knife was a sharp kitchen knife that belonged to my dad, which he'd stuck in her pocket when she was in the kitchen. She never used them, but the fact that she had them was enough to freak me out. The most terrifying part of this horrible nightmare, though, was that my mother had no idea where we lived. Well, she wasn't supposed to have any idea. We moved away, and we moved far away. My dad never told my mom where we'd moved to protect me. She'd broken into the house by breaking one of the downstairs windows and crawled in. I didn't hear it at all, so that must have been when I still had my headphones on or something. The thought of my mom just humming and walking around downstairs, potentially waiting for my dad, while I had no idea, still freaks me out to this day. 
It's been about 10 years now, and I've only seen my mother twice since that night. She's been in some type of institution for years now. She has no memory of that night, but in all fairness, she doesn't have much memory of anything at all. It's sad, but it's true. Every time I hear those Disney songs, I sort of freeze up. I just hope one day I can forget about the fear I felt that night and find a way to remember my mom in a more positive light. I love metal concerts. The atmosphere, the flashing lights, the pounding of the beat up your spine, there's really nothing like it. That very same atmosphere, though, can be a breeding ground for a lot of dangerous activity. I learned that the hard way at my last concert. I went with a friend to see In This Moment, Avatar, New Year's Day, and my personal favorite, Ice Nine Kills, as part of their terror tour. It sounds ominous already, but trust me, that concert was amazing. And they played all our favorites, and like the teenage metalheads we were, we screamed along with all our lungs put into it. New Year's Day went first as an opener, and the flashing lights caused spots in my eyes. Avatar went next, and the first half of their set went flawlessly. They played up the ominous angle of being with the devil between songs, and I got chills as the voice reverberated up my spine. They started up one of my favorite songs from their new album. I remember the gleam in my friend's eyes as she grabbed my arm and shook me in sheer excitement. The music and vocals built and built. The crowd was going absolutely feral down on the floor. I think I even saw someone in the pit get ousted up into the air and crowd surf. The chorus was just about to start when the lead vocalist froze in his tracks and let out a strangled O oh into the mic. The other members stopped playing a second later. The only sound was the quickly fading reverb from the amps on stage. The crowd seemed to hold its breath. Little puffs of smoke from the crowd of bodies on the floor were visible. I could swear they represented someone whose soul had just been scared out of them. People around us started murmuring, everyone wondering what was going on, while the singer was trying to compose things. No one would tell us anything. All of a sudden, he shouted into the mic, Security! Can we get security here? Now! The lights in the arena flicked on one by one, flooding the space with stark white light. After over an hour in the dark, it was almost blinding. After a second of blinking away spots, we could see that near the front of the stage, a small circle had formed in the crowd, giving a wide berth to someone in the middle. That someone was crumpled into a heap on the floor, and they'd started screaming. Security pushed their way through the remaining concert goers and immediately ran to the guy with first aid in tow. They looked like they were struggling to turn him over, and the guy curled around himself as if in pain. I couldn't see very well from where I was sitting, but it seemed like his hands were clasped firmly against his stomach. When one of the security guys finally got him onto his back, the guy's hands accidentally fell to the side. And that's when what can only be described as a baseball-sized bubble of blood exploded across his shirt. Apparently, he'd scooped up the blood in his hands and was praying it didn't fall out. Security immediately realized their mistake and pressed firmly against the wound. People in the crowd began to call 911, and 20 minutes later, EMS and police showed up, with the full flashing lights and stretchers and everything. We were all told to stay calm, and were quickly directed outside to the parking lot. My friend and I clung to each other through the surge, so we wouldn't get separated. I remember that we didn't speak for a long time, even on the drive back. We saw some news that was written about the incident about a month later. Apparently, someone thought that when the guy shoved up against them in the mosh pit, he was hitting on their girlfriend or something. That's when they pulled out a knife and began stabbing him in the stomach. They pled guilty, with the defense that they were extremely high at the time, but that didn't lessen the severity of their sentence. As to how this person managed to sneak a knife past security personnel, we have no idea. It just goes to show you that even though a rough-and-tumble concert can be fun, 
It can also lead to reckless or even dangerous situations when emotions are running that high. About seven or eight years ago, I was living alone in the Sheba countryside, going back and forth to my university. My apartment was on the second floor, and it was a tiny, narrow, and dirty place. I liked it well enough at the time. It was just fine for me. I met a guy at uni, and we started dating. It was a pretty good time. About half a year passed by, and I was living next door to this good-looking office lady. I noticed one day, though, that someone had left a strange-looking note on the small window next to the front door. Let me explain. In the hallway of the building at the top of the stairs, there's this frosted window that belongs to her apartment. It's about at head height on the right-hand side. About 70 centimeters by 40 centimeters. My boyfriend thought it was worrying. What's that about? Maybe we should ask her next time we see her. I asked her about it and she said she had no idea who would put that on her window. She told us that late one night she had decided to have a little peek out through the window, and the second she looked, a face appeared. It really freaked her out, and that frightened me too. She told us she stayed at her boyfriend's apartment most nights now. I mentioned to her that if she ever didn't feel safe or anything, then to knock on our wall and let us know. My boyfriend also said he would come straight away to help. We started to chat with her quite a bit from then on, passing each other and sharing our life stories from time to time. As time continued on though, she said things had gotten much worse. She was planning on moving out of the apartment block altogether, and eventually she did. That's when things started happening to me instead. When I was home alone, in times where I would be doing nothing but lying on my bed, I would start to hear this metallic tapping sound against my door. Since my apartment is quite tiny, you can easily see the door from the bed. I remember once when I was looking over, I even saw the door handle turning gently, as if someone was quietly trying to open it without being noticed. I didn't know who it was or what was going on. Keep calm, I told myself, but for some reason I called out, The door's locked! I heard heavy thuds against the door immediately. They shook the glasses and the kitchen cabinets. Now I was freaked out. The thudding stopped eventually. With someone now trying to break into my apartment, I called the police. They offhandedly told me to beef up security, and that didn't really solve the problem. Something else happened again when I was on my own in there. I remember it was the end of January, Someone was trying to open the door again, but this time even more violently. My whole body went rigid. Thank God I'd remembered to lock the door. I found the courage to creep over to the doorway. I wanted to get a look at the person who was doing this. Someone was standing on the other side of the door. It was some guy. He had a bucket hat pulled way down to cover his eyes. My skin broke out in goosebumps. I was terrified. I wanted to get as far away from the door as possible. That wasn't easy to do in such a tiny apartment. I ran to the other side of the room and called the police again, sobbing uncontrollably into the phone. Are they still there? Can you go to the door and check again? Are they angry, do you think? The cop said. That really made my blood boil. Are you for real? Can't you hear the banging? I tried to keep my composure and not go off on them. I did as they requested, and looked through the peephole again. The man at the door was still there. That sent me into a panic all over. Even though there was a police station five minutes from my house, the policeman told me it was out of his jurisdiction. I pleaded with the guy, and he said they would send someone over to look at my place. They showed up 40 minutes later. Luckily, I'd also decided to call my boyfriend. He came over from his part-time job right away, and he arrived long before the police did. In fact, he caught me while I was still on the phone with them and yelled at the officer. What, does she have to be dead before you come check it out? I smiled at his defending me, but the reality really hit home. 
the person who was trying to break into my apartment was now long gone. It's true that in Japan, the police won't do a thing until someone dies. I hate the police here. I'm sorry to say that, but that's just how I feel. The third time something happened, my boyfriend was in the apartment with me, thankfully. We were washing dishes in the kitchen and drinking some tea, when suddenly he felt a chill, and I felt it too. We both asked at the same time, Hey, are you cold? He then asked me if a window was open. I looked in the direction of the window near my bed and saw it was open just a crack. I also saw a human eye staring right at me. I must have stared at it for about 10 seconds. I tapped on my boyfriend's shoulder. I was too scared to speak. My boyfriend understood the message and ran towards the window, chasing after whoever was staring at us. Unfortunately, the creep had a mountain bike positioned right at the ready just below my window and got away. We couldn't have gotten down the stairs quick enough to chase him, living on the second floor and all. I could see him speeding away as I looked down from the corridor. One of the fence posts below my window had been broken, which is probably how he was able to climb up to the window. By the way, my bathroom is near the door of my apartment since it's such a tiny place like I said before. That made my skin crawl, and I applied for other apartments immediately after that incident. Shortly after this had happened, my boyfriend and I broke up. We didn't have a big falling out or anything, it just kind of fizzled out. I was glad we were able to move on without any hard feelings, to be honest. We decided to split up over coffee one evening, and he said he had to tell me something before we parted ways. He told me that he thought the guy who had been messing with me had been the same guy doing stuff to the woman who lived next door to me. Kind of like a stalker, really. I already guessed that, to be honest. I was joking, trying to lighten the mood, saying I lost a boyfriend but gained a stalker. He went deathly quiet. You know, I was really scared when that guy was staring at us in your room that night. There's something I didn't tell you, which I probably should have. He said that when he saw that guy getting on his bike and riding away, he noticed a big knife in his hand. I'm so glad he was there at the time that creep came. Who knows what would have happened if he wasn't. I was able to move out soon after, and my ex even helped me. He said I could call him anytime I was frightened, but I haven't been scared once in my new place. What was the purpose of that guy messing with me? What did he want? To rob me? Was he a stalker? Was he planning on doing something a lot worse? I think about it all the time. I don't ever want to be in that neighborhood again. Thinking about it now, that metallic tapping sound I heard against the door could have very well been the knife my ex mentioned. I don't like to think about that kind of stuff at nighttime. In case you're wondering, that apartment is still there as well. I'm an investigator, and I'm gonna tell you about the most disturbing stalking case I ever worked. This story takes place in the mountains a few years ago. I had been entrusted to look into a sharp increase in the number of reported stalking cases in the area. I was placed in charge of a group trying to resolve these stalkings. I got a letter from one particular household, which simply read, Please make all this stop. I decided to tackle this one first. The client hadn't been physically hurt by the stalker, but they said they'd seen them standing outside their family home multiple times, watching them. The client who wrote to us wasn't the victim themselves, but the victim's wife instead. She said she wanted this to end, before somebody got hurt. The next day, I posted up near their family home and waited for this creep to appear. However, there was no trace of said stalker. Not that day, nor for the rest of the week. I made an interim report to explain that the person had not been spotted. As I was explaining this to the client, she cut me off and blurted out that the stalker had been there the whole time and I must be blind. 
I showed her all the photos I'd taken for the job and told her that I hadn't seen anyone there. I couldn't believe that I had missed something. I could tell she was skeptical, so I asked her if she wanted me to continue with my investigation. She agreed and I continued with said investigation, expecting to find nothing at this point. I was questioning if the client was having hallucinations possibly. The next day though, I finally saw what the client was talking about. Someone showed up while I was staking out the house and I immediately started taking photos and shooting video with plans to show it to the client. Later that night, I showed my findings to them and asked, is this the lady who's been stalking your husband? Her face went pale and she nodded. Things intensified when I saw the woman again the next night. I noticed there was a car parked outside their house. I was with my colleague this time. He ran the plates with the transportation bureau and said he was told there was no vehicle registered with that plate number. We decided to tail this suspicious car. It headed out through the mountain roads. Because it was late at night, no cars passed us by, so we had to keep our distance and watch the car, speeding ahead along the dangerous roads. The stalker's car veered off onto a dirt road at some point and suddenly stopped altogether. We wondered if our cover had been blown. The car was stationary and no one was getting out. We were far enough away at the entrance of the dirt road. My colleague said she wouldn't notice if we went by foot, but she might hear the car coming. I couldn't argue with that. And to be honest, this situation was a bit unnerving. I got out and crept toward the stalker's car. It was parked next to an old and battered, dilapidated house that looked like it had been abandoned for a long time. I remember thinking to myself, could anyone really live here? I noticed there were no lights on in the house at all. The car did stop here though, so the stalker must be in there. I staked it out for 20 minutes. I wanted to see if there were any signs of life in the house. What surprised me in the next moment was a terrible shriek coming from the house. I started shaking when I heard it again. It really freaked me out. I ran back to the car to check on my colleague, but when I got back, he was gone. I thought he would be there waiting for me to return. I called out to him, but the second I did, I heard a cell phone ringing. The cold, generic ringtone pierced through the mountain air. It was coming from a bush near the side of the dirt road. I crept over to take a look. The cell phone was laying on the ground. It was my colleague's phone. I went over and grabbed it and answered it. I heard someone saying some garbled speech and then the line cut out. I tried to call back, but the phone was out of signal. If he was waiting in the car, why would his phone be lying in the bushes? I heard more screeches coming from the house. What could be going on in there? Could he be in there with that stalker? It was one of the worst moments of my life. I felt like my mind was thick with fog. I couldn't stand the terror in that scream. It was something like I'd never heard before. It's something I haven't heard since. My colleague's phone began to ring again. I thought it was out of signal. Who the hell was calling? I answered it. Of course I had to. I heard my colleague's voice, and then I heard some garbled speech again. I ran back to the car, threw open the door, got in, and locked it. I just waited to see if he would come back. I didn't know what else I could do. The first light of morning came and he still wasn't back yet. I went towards the house. I wanted to know what was making the noises in there and if something had happened to him. The other car was still parked outside. Was she still there, I thought, as I entered the house. There was nothing inside, no signs of life at all, yet I'd heard all that screeching. It was so weird. The place was completely abandoned. I went back outside and looked at the stalker's car. It was really old and damaged and looked like it could fall apart at any moment. The interior was full of dust. I waited as long as I could in the hopes that my colleague would suddenly reappear and this would all be over, but after several more hours there was no sign of him. I went back to the office to report what had happened that night and to see if anyone had heard from him. There was no news. The other guys from my office came with me to check out the abandoned building, but we couldn't find a shred of evidence. 
We'd been back there at later dates to check on it as well. There's been no signs of life there. After some time, my colleague's family reported him missing, since there was no evidence of foul play, and we can't identify a suspect or his whereabouts. The case is very likely to go cold. I've been searching for any clues that could lead me to what happened to him, but so far I have nothing. I couldn't even use the photos or the video I took. Some of the files became corrupted. I went back to the client and they said they hadn't seen the person since. I wonder what on earth happened to my colleague and what on earth was going on with that person. My colleague is still missing to this day and I pray he'll be found safely someday. I'm a European woman currently staying in a South American capital. Being a foreigner, I guess I tend to stand out a little, but I didn't really feel threatened or in danger at all during the entire month I spent there. That was until yesterday. I was waiting for the bus alone at around 3 p.m. on a Sunday. No one else was around. All of a sudden, some guy appeared in the distance. I can't really say why exactly, but he looked really shady to me. Probably because it looked like he was walking straight towards me, even though the pavement was pretty wide. I pretended that I didn't see him and waited for him to pass me by. Instead, he came right up to me and asked me for money. Maybe something else? I didn't quite understand what he was saying. I answered very firmly that I did not have anything to give him at this moment and stepped back a little, keeping my hand up and trying to show that I was not disturbed. He kept coming closer to me and making me feel very uncomfortable. He then started shoving his finger in my face. I'll kill you. I'm gonna kill you. He said that repeatedly over and over. I started to think I might really be in danger, even if the guy didn't have a visible weapon on him. I had no idea what this stranger was capable of, especially as he was so extremely close to me and was threatening to directly kill me, still trying to calmly walk away from him as to not show I was panicking. I looked all around for someone who might be able to help me. The street was completely deserted. That's when I saw the bus coming in. I waved at it and the doors were already open. I climbed in without looking back. The driver's assistant told me to hurry up and get in. He had seen the scene from a distance and told me not to worry. We just needed to get away from this crazy guy. This all happened within the span of 30 seconds, but a lot could have gone wrong in such a short amount of time, or if I'd been forced to stay there any longer. I'm glad that I remained relatively calm, and I'll probably have to invest in some protection like pepper spray in the future. It was around 2015. I was living in Seattle and I worked in an office that allowed me to bring my dog to work, a 100-pound German Shepherd. She's a big sweetheart, but looks quite scary to strangers. After work one day, I got on the bus home, which was around a 45-minute ride, when I noticed someone staring at me. I didn't really think much of it. While it was a bit unsettling to be watched, I'd had my fair share of odd conversations on the bus, and it wasn't out of the ordinary to encounter some weird behavior every now and then. I honestly don't remember much about the guy's appearance. I do remember thinking he looked like a completely average guy, though, and didn't seem high or drunk or anything like that. My bus stop was on a busy street in a bit of a sketchier part of town. It wasn't frequently trafficked, either. When we reached the stop, my dog and I set off on the short track home, only a few blocks away. As I exited the bus, I noticed the man who had been watching me exited at the same time. Something was off about him. He seemed intent on keeping stride with me, trailing closely behind me. I've heard advice somewhere in the past that you shouldn't go straight home if you're being followed. I'm sure that's situation-specific, and sometimes it's safer to be inside your home 
but nothing had happened yet besides having my personal space invaded. I didn't feel like I was in immediate danger yet, so I opted not to lead the stranger straight to my home. I knew my partner at the time was not there, so I decided my best plan was to weave through the neighborhood for several blocks and try to lose this guy. I think a part of me also wanted to be sure I was being followed at all. Maybe this person just happened to be walking in the same direction. After several blocks, though, it became quite clear that he was directly following me. I was weaving around pretty erratically, and he was even walking the same path as me. Neither of us spoke to one another, and I was becoming more and more frustrated that this guy would follow a woman home. The streets were quiet and I couldn't see anybody around who I could signal for help. I don't think I would have been too surprised if this was happening while I was alone and without my dog, but I can't imagine anyone in their right mind following someone with a big German shepherd right by them. I started walking faster when I rounded a corner and quickly ducked into a walkway, hugging a duplex about a block from my house. I was hoping the pathway would wrap around completely so I could get out of line of sight of this person. I was unfortunately met with a fence to my face. I didn't have time to backtrack, and I was now cornered in this nook between a house, a fence, and a hedge. I crouched down with my dog and waited for the guy to pass us by. I watched as the man strolled by the walkway, seemingly not noticing us at all. He didn't turn his head or even gaze in our direction. I decided we'd stay there for a few minutes, just to make sure that he was gone. Of course, my dog was as calm as ever, just chilling on his side taking a nap. How helpful. After about three minutes went by, just as I was thinking it was safe to start heading home, the man stepped into my line of sight again. He didn't make eye contact with me, just as he hadn't the first time. He walked by and was moving calmly and deliberately. He came slowly to a stop as soon as he was right in front of me, just off the curb. He was about two yards away, now facing me, not directly looking at me. There was just a sidewalk and a grassy strip between us. I watched him as he started to unload his pockets. He had a number of metal objects he was taking out and placing them in a line. To this day, I'm still not sure what they were, but I'm glad I didn't have to find out. At this point, I called 911 and told them what was happening. Someone was following me and showing me erratic behavior. The cops made it there as quickly as they could and soon pulled up to the scene. The dispatcher advised me to get out of there. I hightailed it out of my hiding spot and took a non-direct path home, since my house was technically in line of sight of where I'd been hiding. I don't know what ended up happening to the guy, but fortunately I never saw him again. I'm not sure if he was on drugs or mentally unstable or both. I don't know if he had any malicious intent, but I hope he got the help he needed. I'm a transgender male, and at the time I was 18. I passed fairly well. I was dating someone online on and off for like a year and a half and finally saved up enough to get a Greyhound bus pass to get from where I'm from to where she lives. It was about a 16 hour ride with a few bus switches along the way. One of the bus stops was in Ohio, Cincinnati to be exact. This was my first time being out of state ever and taking a bus, and well, besides school buses, I was all on my own. I'm a short guy, probably around 5'2 or so. It was around 4 or 5 a.m., and I believe we were just arriving in Ohio. I sat down in a little cafe area until my next bus was going to arrive. All of a sudden, this dirty, scrawny guy holding a random license plate sat down across from me. He made a little small talk then literally asked me if he could pay to do disgusting intimate things with him. I was freaking out already. It's at this point I kind of froze and looked to the people next to me in hopes they'd help me out. I obviously told the guy no. He then asked if he could sell me then. At this point I got up and ran as far into the crowd as I could. 
I called my dad, and the guy disappeared. I didn't see him again. The messed up part is when I finally got to the girl, she told me her dad had a heart attack. It ended up being a lie, I guess. I had to leave. I had spent my money besides for food, water, and a taxi to get from the last bus stop to her city, which was not cheap. Then I had to give her friend gas money to take me back to the bus stop. I didn't have enough to rent out a room, and my dad couldn't afford to wire me any to get a room for the night. I had to just sit at the bus stop literally until 8pm for the next bus. Because it was a smaller town and part of it was closed, I had to sit outside the bus station for a long time. It was honestly one of the scariest and most terrible experiences of my life. About 30 years ago, my mom went on a blind date. Her date took her to a restaurant, and although he was nice enough, she just wasn't that into him. Not even halfway through the meal, she was already thinking of ways to leave early. The waiter could tell that something was going on. While my mom's date was in the restroom, the waiter approached her and asked her if she was okay. She explained that she was on a blind date and not having that much fun. It turns out the waiter was just about to get off work, and he offered her a ride home if she'd wait for another 10 minutes. She considered it and was about to say yes when her date came back from the restroom. She gave a simple headshake no to the waiter and then smiled. She and her date finished their meal, and then he took her home just fine. The next night, my mom was watching the evening news when a story came on. It was about a woman being raped and murdered behind a restaurant the night before. The restaurant was the very same one she had been at. They showed the murderer's picture, and it was the very same waiter from that night. My cousin and his family had lived in their house for about five years now. His wife left home to drop the baby off at daycare before work, but realized she had left her phone at home. Entering the house, she turned the corner to the hallway and nearly ran into the drop-down attic ladder, which was fully extended. They never used the attic, as it was filled with loose insulation. She quietly left the house and drove around the corner. She called the police. When the police arrived and investigated, they found a short-range transmitter connected to several cameras hidden throughout their home. The light fixture, in the shower, in the ceiling fan above their bed, even a pinhole in the nursery. They were all sending videos to a nearby location. Their neighbor, a few houses away, had been given a key by the prior owners and installed surveillance equipment inside, once he knew their schedule. My cousin's wife had walked in on him updating his equipment, but he forgot something at his house and left to get it when she walked in. He had been watching them for years now. My grandpa worked two night shifts, so my grandma was home alone most nights. Her sister-in-law, Rose, would randomly come over to keep her company. My grandma decided to go to bed early one night. Rose came over that night to see how she was doing. She went to my grandma's bedroom. After calling for her, she received a reply of, I'm in bed, just come on in. Upon entering the room, Rose started acting strangely and telling my grandma that she really wanted her to get up and come help her with something in the kitchen. My grandma was ready to go to sleep and was already in bed. She didn't want to, but Rose was really admin for her to come help right now, telling her that it was extremely urgent. After a while, my grandma eventually got up and followed Rose to the kitchen. Upon entering, Rose whispered to her in a panic with tears in her eyes. There's a man under your bed with a knife. My grandma, of course, didn't believe her at first, but seeing the panic in Rose's eyes, she knew she must be telling the truth. 
They proceeded to call the police and left to the neighbor's house. The cops came and found a man hiding in the closet with a butcher knife. A group of friends was staying at this remote cabin that one of my friend's cousins owned. There were no roads leading to the cabin, and it was a good three or four day hike from where you parked the cars. I myself couldn't go at the same time as everyone else, due to some work obligations. I decided to head up the same day but a bit later, which meant I would have to camp out by myself for a while. The latter part of the trail is too dangerous to be taken at night, especially for someone who doesn't know it very well. I didn't care though. I was kind of looking forward to it, as I'd never camped alone before. I was in the middle of these woods when the sun went down. I got my camp set up in a small clearing, probably about 40 feet across. I got my campfire going and pitched a small tent as well. I did all that camping stuff, like cooking hot dogs on a stick over the fire and making some s'mores. I probably stayed up for a good two or three hours after dark. The entire time, I thought I could hear some stuff moving out in the woods on the edge of the clearing. I didn't really think anything of it, because the woods are full of animals, of course. As the night went on, though, I realized that whatever it was making these noises was just circling the clearing over and over again. Once I really started paying attention, I heard it make four or five laps around. I decided to get up and investigate this noise. The noise stopped as soon as I stood up, though, and I thought I could hear some sound rushing away through the woods. I shrugged it off, thinking it was just some fox that probably got curious, and then got scared when I stood up. I decided it was time to go to sleep. I doused the fire and climbed into my tent. I started to doze off, and stayed in a half-awake, half-asleep state for a while. I normally hear some weird things when I'm in this state, so I didn't think much of it when I heard a voice. Something woke me up completely, though and I realized the voice was real and right outside my tent. It was just above a whisper, and I'm not sure if it was in another language or if they were speaking English in such a way I couldn't understand. I laid there for I don't know how long, listening to them talking and waiting for something to happen. There was just enough moonlight to light up the walls of the tent so I could see a hand pressed on the wall of it right down near my foot. This freaked me out, and I sat up quickly. Whoever was outside the tent then disappeared. I could hear them running full sprint through the woods. I got out of my tent and shined my flashlight all around. I could see nothing. I expected there to be a bloody handprint on the outside of my tent or something, but there was no evidence anyone had been there. I couldn't sleep at all that night. I packed up my camp first light and that morning I booked it to the cabin. I remember playing around with a radio once when I was a kid, just slowly scanning through the static and trying to find a station. I had found an old television antenna attached to the side of our house and ran a wire out my window to it with an alligator clip attached to the radio antenna. That allowed me to get a broader range of signals. I'm sitting there early in the morning at like 2 a.m., slowly sweeping through the frequencies, when suddenly I get to this station that's playing this very strange crackling sound. It sounded like cracking knuckles, or perhaps Rice Krispie cereal, but with a fixed rhythmic pattern instead of being random. I sat there listening to it for a moment, when suddenly it stopped altogether. This faint voice came on. It took a second for the weight of the words to hit me, but when they did, I freaked out and almost threw the radio across the room. I'm pretty sure it was just someone messing around with a radio transmitter, but I'll be damned if that didn't scare the hell out of me.
About five years ago, my mom started dating a guy she'd met on a dating site. I had recently started dating the woman who would later become my wife as well. We had met online ourselves. My wife and I never really liked this guy. We didn't think he was mean or anything like that. He was just a little bit creepy. He was extremely quiet and kept his eyes closed a lot. He would occasionally say and do odd things as well, like offering my wife a chocolate, then popping one in his mouth and closing his eyes, and moaning as he let it melt with his mouth open. One time, my wife and I were visiting my mom, but she got called into work. We waited at her house. Her boyfriend was over as well, but he spent the entire several hours just waiting in her bedroom with the door closed. Just before Christmas, my mom and this guy started having some difficulties in their relationship. My wife and I were visiting her for the holidays, and she dropped all of her problems on us at once. We listened carefully and gave her our opinions. We suggested that perhaps she would be better off without him. She had already made up her mind and decided to break up with him on Christmas Eve. We spent the night at my mom's and got up early on Christmas morning to visit my dad at his house. We didn't plan to spend the night at my dad's, but we got snowed in, which was actually a bit of a nice Christmas surprise. The next day, we left as soon as we could get through all the snow. My wife suggested we stop by my mom's house on the way back so we could check to see if she was alright. My wife had a really bad feeling about my mom's now ex-boyfriend. My mom's car was in the driveway, but that doesn't mean much. She lives close enough to work that she often walks there, and it hadn't snowed in her town. She also never locked her door, which really drove me crazy. We let ourselves in. That's when we saw blood oozing out of the refrigerator's water dispenser. It had filled up to spill over the container and was now leaking onto the floor and making a puddle. My wife screamed, and I freaked out. I fully expected to see my mom's head in the freezer. I nervously opened it to find a bag of frozen cherries that had been opened and crammed into the freezer in such a way that they fell onto the ice dispenser and melted right there. It turned out that nothing nefarious had really happened, but it was one of the scariest moments of my entire life. A month ago, I met a man on Tinder with who the flow went rather well. He was interesting, cultured. I was rather confident in this and happy not to fall for once about a person who was only looking for a one-night stand. We had mutual friends, so when he offered me to sleep at his place, I accepted without being too suspicious. My friends all told me he was a super nice person. Very calm and easy to get along with and trust. So, I had blind trust in this person. It was stupid to think like that. I realize that now. I arrived at his house around 9pm or so. When I entered his apartment, I immediately got a bad feeling. The atmosphere was gloomy. There was almost no light. The decorations were very dark. I kinda didn't feel comfortable. We decided to sit down to smoke and started to chat a bit. As the discussion progressed onward, I learned that he had some sort of autism, and as a result, he had a lot of trouble understanding social situations, and had difficulty deciphering the difference between what is good and what is bad. An important thing as well, he told me that he decodes non-verbal language very well, and knows directly what a person is thinking just by observing their body. He then made me read all these poems he wrote. They were terrifying, honestly. He recounted the rear of a child in very precise detail, bordering on a hidden fantasy. I pretended to enjoy hearing it, so as to not show that I found it really creepy. During the discussion, we came to talk about his ex-girlfriend somehow. He told me he used to have fun drowning and choking her when they took a shower together, to see what it was like to have control over her life. I found that very disturbing. It was getting worse and worse. I was on edge. There were too many signs I could no longer ignore. He offered me a drink and I accepted. We went into his kitchen. 
He took out a glass, and that's when I noticed a gun out on the kitchen counter. I didn't say anything. I wondered why he'd put it right there in the spotlight. He saw my panicked look and told me, don't worry, it belongs to my father. That didn't reassure me very much. The minutes that followed were the longest of my life. I was very wary in case he decided to try and hurt me. I was tense to the max, and I wanted to get out of this place quickly. He told me that his neighbor might come by during the evening. He was a dealer who sold weapons, and from what he told me was a big super dangerous psycho. At that moment, I decided to call my father so he could come and pick me up quickly. I pretended to have an important thing to do the next day and tried to be as nice as possible so he wouldn't notice I was completely terrified of him. I just counted the minutes from then on, checking to see if my dad had texted me he was downstairs. The guy seemed to notice that I was being wary though, and deep down I knew that he saw I was just trying to run away. I was afraid he would act out. I kept trying to pretend everything was okay. I told myself that if he wanted to hurt me, and if he saw I was afraid, he would take action directly, telling himself he no longer had time to pretend. He offered me a massage. I tried to find an excuse to have him not give me one, but he insisted. My father was going to arrive at any minute. I gave in out of fear of what he would do. I found myself suddenly having my clothes torn off and being touched in a very suggestive way. I just hoped he wouldn't try anything further. Right as he was about to touch my chest, my cell phone rang, and my father told me he was in the driveway. I jumped out of bed and headed straight out, thanking my dad for arriving at the perfect time. The guy texted me several times after to come back, telling me I had forgotten a sweater and needed to come pick it up in person. I blocked him afterward and never heard from him again. Well, almost not. One of my friends had also matched with him on Tinder and chatted with him. She told me that she asked him to go into town for a drink and that he refused, telling her she should meet up with him at his place. I warned my friend who immediately blocked him. I don't know if this guy would have been capable of doing something truly horrific to me if he was really malicious or just a weird guy. In any case, be really careful on Tinder and don't go to people's houses that you've never met before even if you have friends in common. You never really know a person 100%. To start things off, I'm a 26-year-old woman. I'm also quite petite, which can make me appear a lot younger than I really am. I'm a New Hampshire resident, and I live a rather short distance away from a state hospital known as Concord. I used to work in the Steeplegate Mall, which unfortunately has been dying. Due to the lack of foot traffic, naturally many stores ended up shutting down because of that. The mall has become more of a dead zone by the day, making it a hot spot for shady people. There have been many times when I've seen people who were clearly under the heavy influence of drugs hanging around. I'm not sure if it was heroin or whatever, but you could tell just by looking at these people and trying to communicate with them that they just weren't all there. Some of these customers would even walk in bleeding without even knowing how it happened. Now that you understand the details, let's get into the story. One night, me and my friend, who I'll refer to as Tony, decided to take an Uber into town. I was feeling a bit down over some drama that was happening in my personal life. Tony wanted to cheer me up and get me out of the house for a while. We were having a great time going into the stores and getting in our exercise. The mall would be closing soon, so we decided to take advantage of my employee discount and grab something to eat. We exited the mall. It was around 8 p.m. and it was pretty dark outside. The parking lot was mostly empty, aside from a few cars. We were making our way to the art store when we suddenly saw a white car drop someone off. This person appeared to be male, but we couldn't quite see his face. He soon disappeared into the bushes. 
Tony was keeping an eye on the man, while I was watching the driver peel out of the parking lot. We both thought that would be the end of the white car, but less than a minute later, the car came back around. Now attempting to get closer to us, he would peel out on the pavement, getting more and more aggressive the closer he got. Tony and I were both scared by this point. It felt as if my heart was about to pop out of my throat. Tony looked like she was in utter shock and disbelief. I quickly started to look for a place we could possibly hide, and saw the back door to a bond time that went out of business. I suggested to Tony we should make a break for that door. Our legs were sore from all the walking we'd done that day, but primal fear that we were both feeling propelled us forward. We booked it through the back door, figuring it would at least buy us some time and we could call for help. However, we entered a small room that had another door that led into the main area. That door was locked, preventing us from going any further. We pulled out our phones. My heart sank. I realized my phone was dead, and Tony's phone was glitching out so bad that it was unusable. She was struggling with her phone when we both heard the car slowly drive by the door. I immediately felt my stomach drop. I thought that this would be the end. Whoever this psychopath was was going to kidnap me and my friend, and this is how he would die. Luckily, it seemed the driver lost interest and drove off in a hurry. It took a lot of courage for us to even open the door. We left as quietly as we could. After multiple attempts of restarting her phone, Tony was finally able to get it to work. She then called up an Uber driver to drive us home. The next day, I brought this up to my boss, and she told me there had been a lot of suspicious people coming through that end of the mall. Apparently, a charter school was located in that area, and some sketchy individuals had been spying on the children there. Mall security would be patrolling that area much more thoroughly from then on. Tony and I are convinced that this person may have thought we were kids that attended that school because of our appearance. In early September, the store that I worked at ended up closing as well, and not even a month after I stopped working there, there was a shooting in the mall parking lot. It was ruled a murder-suicide. A woman was shot by her boyfriend, and then he turned the gun on himself. He was found dead at the scene, and the woman was taken to the hospital where she later succumbed to her injuries. After being harassed in the parking lot that night, and now hearing about the shooting in the area, let's just say Tony and I will be staying away from there forever onward. It's clearly not a very safe place to be. We both learned a valuable lesson that night. Never walk through a parking lot in spots where most people can't see you, especially at night. And make sure your phone is always charged, because you never know when you might need it. This happened about five or six years ago. I was in my mid-twenties, and I lived in a small town with access to a lake, which made it a popular spot for tourists from the northern suburbs of Chicago. It was early in the fall, so tourist season was winding down, and things were starting to return to a more quiet, if not somewhat boring, pace. I was off work that day, and I decided to get out and enjoy some fresh air. For me, this often meant sitting on a park bench and watching the lake, and all of its comings and goings for a while, before getting up to walk down to the lakefront and over to the beach house. I slowly wandered across the park and over to this old wooden bench that went over a creek that fed into the lake. This led to a small sidewalk that extended to a side access road. People liked to set up lawn chairs and sit in the grass in this area. There was also this large tree that had to have been there for more than a century and served as a natural rally point. I was approaching that tree when I stopped to take in the view. It was at this point I realized I'd left my phone at home. There were no chairs up that day, and I was the only one on the sidewalk. Traffic on the main road had been pretty light, and there was only one car parked on the access road. It was a perfect day. 
As I stood there, though, I heard the unmistakable sound of a car slowly pulling up behind me. I didn't think anything of it at first. I fully expected the vehicle to just pass me by and pull up into one of the parking spots. However, it didn't do so. My next thought was that my dad may have come down to see what I was up to. He also liked to hang out at the same park I did, but when I didn't hear the familiar greeting, I started to pay closer attention. I always look like I'm totally lost in thought when I'm out there, but I actually do keep a pretty good eye on my surroundings. The vehicle behind me was putting me on edge. Once in a while, people stop at odd spots to snap pictures of the lake, but I got the distinct feeling that it was not the lake that was being watched right now. I peered over my shoulder and saw a red Ford minivan sitting there. The windows were heavily tinted, but I could make out that there was a man sitting in the driver's seat and he was looking right at me. The thing that got me the most was the sight of the front license plate. It read, and I kid you not, Skinner. I gave this van a good once over to let the driver know that I'd seen him. I also did my best to make my posture seem like I was not nervous. I was alert. I decided to move a bit further down the sidewalk. Like I wasn't unsettled by Mr. Skinner and his minivan, I stopped again when I heard the sound of his tires rolling over the pavement. He was following me, doing his best to keep about ten feet away. I started going over what-if scenarios in my head. I could see a creep wanting to hang around and stalk me if I was an attractive woman or something, but I'm a fat guy of average height, so I never considered I would be the target of an abduction. I glanced around again and saw no one else walking down the sidewalk. It was just me in this van. I decided to walk off the concrete and into the grass like I was going to stand by the water. I made my way around that big tree and stood out of sight. I listened in for the sound of van doors opening, but all I heard was the sound of the engine idling. The driver wasn't getting out, but he wasn't leaving either. I began to wonder how long he would sit there and wait, so I stayed out of sight for a good ten minutes, hoping he would get bored finally. At that point, I saw a figure coming from the direction of the beach. It was an old man, maybe in his late seventies. I reached into my pocket, where I kept a knife. I figured this old guy was going to be my ticket to break this waiting game with Mr. Skinner here. He was either going to make his move, in which case I would be ready, or he was going to bug out because we weren't alone anymore. As the old man got closer, I could tell he was eyeing me and the minivan. I came from around the tree and back into Skinner's view and began walking towards the old man. My hand was still in my pocket as I approached him. He looked a little unsure of me. I made a big show of being very friendly with him. I contemplated telling this old guy the van was following me and to call the police, but I decided not to. When we finally got within a few feet of each other, we struck up a conversation. I started commenting on how great a day it was for a walk. I heard the minivan move again. It crept past us back onto the main road and drove away. The old man turned to watch it, and after it was gone, he made mention that the guy inside had just been sitting there staring at me. I laughed a bit and told the man that's why I'd been behind the tree in the first place. The old man went about his own way, and I milled around that part of the sidewalk for about five minutes, trying to figure out what the guy in the minivan wanted and why he'd chosen that for a license plate. I happened to look back towards the park, and just beyond that was my car. I had parked just off the main intersection because the park was right there. I thought about turning around and heading back and calling it quits and moving on from that strange ordeal. That's when I saw him once more. He was turning onto the main east-west street and heading my way again. I took out my knife and flipped open the blade. I started picking at my thumbnail with it. He missed the turn to get back onto the side road, but he slowed way down and stared straight at me the entire time. This time, I made sure he saw my knife in my hand. Once he fully passed by, he accelerated and vanished in the same direction he had gone the first time. I was pretty confident he would make a third pass, and if I was still in the open and alone, he would come back and would have another weird standoff. 
whatever he was up to, I wasn't going to be out in the open for him. If he really wanted me, he'd have to come looking. I walked further down by the beach. There was a lot of tree cover there, and there were a few cubbies for people to sit in and watch the beach. I camped out in one and waited for the van to come back. I figured he wasn't coming back after about a half an hour, and at that point I just wanted to go home. I walked back the way I had come from, keeping a watchful eye out for the van. I'm glad to say he never did make his return. To this day, I have no idea what that guy wanted. His plates were Wisconsin plates, but I had never seen that van before. I asked around town and no one else could recall a van of that same make and model. Not even with the particularly distinct license plate. I still think about it from time to time and often wonder what would have happened if he had gotten out of his van. I always envisioned he had a syringe or something he would have stuck into my arm and knocked me out. From there, I don't know. Thinking about this incident is always followed by the hope that he hasn't tried something like this with someone else. After all, Wisconsin is the state that gave us Ed Gein and Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm extremely grateful that old man walked up when he did, so I didn't have to find out what Mr. Skinner's real motives were. I should preface this by saying I have some pretty severe agoraphobia. This has meant I haven't been outside in years. I've done a lot of therapy though, and I'm starting to make my way back into the world. Very, very slowly. One of the ways I'm starting to get back on it is walking. Not far, only a kilometer or so, and not very far from my home either. I go out when it's very quiet, very early in the morning, or fairly late in the evening. This is because my agoraphobia is around people and social interaction more than the actual outside. A few days ago, I was walking along like I do, headphones in without music. I like the noise cancelling effect. I was doing my best, a little worn out but determined to do this to improve my health. As I was walking down the side street at the start of my little loop though, I started to hear the bushes rustling. I looked over to them. It was a bit breezy, and I'm not that paranoid, only this rustling seemed oddly rhythmic. I kept walking, and along the way, the bushes next to me would rustle at odd intervals. I stopped and looked at them a bit closer. I took my headphones off. When I did, my heart leapt into my throat. I could hear someone breathing, actual quietly panting. I looked around for where the hedge broke and could see a person slip through. I could see that back the way I'd came, the hedge went all the way around the corner. I turned tail and hoofed it back. Last night, I went out again, having convinced myself it must have been a breeze. Or maybe I was just being weird and having a hallucination or something. Despite this, I reversed the loop, so the hedge was at the end of the walk now. Today, unlike the other day, the street lights were on, which was much better. I took my headphones off to be safe, and was finishing my walk on the hedge-lined street when I heard it again, the rustling. Only this time, with the lighting, I could see the bush beside me actually moving, it was shaking back and forth. I backed up a few steps and contemplated going back the long way around. That meant passing the end of the row of hedges where whoever it was could pop out and attack me. Instead, I sped walked down the path beside the hedge. I was going faster this time so I could hear the other person jogging to get ahead of me and shaking the bushes the whole time. I could hear them panting. I could even hear them giggle when I stumbled. I got to the edge, and on the corner, the hedge had been cut back so it was balder. I could see through it as I hurried past, and I just about caught the silhouette of somebody. Somebody rake thin, crouched in the bushes with their back heaving and panting breaths. Before I could register it, I was already around the corner and hurrying home, checking over my shoulder every two steps. Safe to say I haven't been back out for a walk today. I don't know what the weirdo was up to, but I don't want to run into him again.
My story happened a few hours ago. I was watching the Champions League final with friends at a friend's house less than two kilometers from my own. At the end of the match, everybody was going their own ways home. My friends left me at an intersection because they lived on the other side. Now, I was all alone. To get home, I have to go through a passage, kind of like a mini forest to save time. It was completely dark because the town hall turns off the lights at 10 p.m. When I got closer to home, arriving near the forest area, I got a bad feeling. That rarely ever happened to me when walking this path. I told myself that it was nothing and that I shouldn't worry too much. I was wrong. I could hear some sounds flashing in the distance for at least 30 seconds, then nothing. I didn't necessarily pay much attention to it, even though it was really weird. After a few seconds though, I got an even more intense bad feeling, as if someone was staring down on me. I could hear footsteps. My brain told me to look behind me immediately, and when I turned around, I saw a figure walking very discreetly. They were crouched down, with what I believed to be a knife in their hands. Seeing this, I ran like I'd never run before. I heard the steps behind me accelerating for about 10 seconds. I no longer heard them after, but I continued to sprint either way. I even fell to the ground about 200 meters from my house. What frightened me the most during this chase is that during that time, the guy hadn't said a single word. All I could hear was his footsteps and his heavy breathing. I returned home without ever looking back. I then stayed on my terrace with my mother to tell her everything. Thankfully, it seemed the guy did not continue to chase me because I did not see him pass in front of my house after. One night on my cousin's farm, me, my two cousins, and two family friends were sitting on some hay bales as it got dark out, waiting for the coyotes to come out. Me and the two family friends decided it would be funny for one of us to throw a shoe to make some noise, then ditch my cousin on the hay bale. The four of us ran to the barn, while my cousin stayed behind. We stayed in the barn for a good 30 minutes, waiting for her to come find us, but she never did. We went to check on her, but she wasn't there. We found her back inside the house. The creepy part is when we talked to her. She asked which of us had been running around banging on the fence. We got really confused because we had run straight for the barn, so we asked her what she meant. Apparently, she had seen a person sneaking around in a black sweatshirt with the hood up. They had taken a stick and was just smacking it against the fence several times. She had thought it was us, since we'd all been wearing black hoodies. We were certain she wasn't lying, because she asked us first and proudly declared we did not scare her. The next day, all five of us were out fishing, when my uncle said there had been two people out walking around by the gravel pit near the hay bales, who he thought was two of us. We still don't know who that was sneaking out there that night, nor what their main goal was. I'm 25, born and raised in Arizona. This literally just happened to me, so I decided to share it with all of you wonderful people this evening. I'm a huge stoner and so I don't drive. I decided to take a bus a few miles down to the dispensary. This was at about 8.30, I believe. I wanted to get a new Indica cart. Purple Punch, it's my favorite by far. I got it and walked back towards the bus stop to head on back home. As I walked closer to the bus bench, though, I noticed a guy was already sitting there. I didn't really think much of it. I'm antisocial and so I always go into any social setting ready to be absolutely silent. I didn't even get a chance to do that this time. As I'm sitting down, he started asking me something. I had my headphones on though, so I couldn't quite tell what he was saying. I took them off and asked him what he'd said. 
He responded, Did you want to get your hair cut? While staring at me with very wide eyes, not blinking at all. If I were a betting man, I'd say this guy was on something. I'm not here to judge anybody. I understand addiction very well. I just definitely was not expecting that question. Oh, uh, I think I'm alright. I then noticed he was wearing an Arizona Cardinals uniform. I just so happened to be an Arizona Cardinals fan myself. So, since my entire socializing ability revolves around sports, I decided to ask him, Hey, uh, you a Cardinals fan? He looked at me kind of funny for a second. No, I just got this a few months ago. Oh, uh, okay. So, how long you been cutting hair? Without blinking, he answered immediately. Just picked it up a few months ago. Who taught you how to cut it? I asked, even more sketched out at this point. His eyes shifted, and he said, I learned on my own. Come on, man, let me touch up the back a little bit. Mind you, he was consistently pushing to cut my hair throughout this entire conversation. I even told him, Yo, I don't have any cash on me right now, indicating I couldn't even pay for the service even if I wanted to. He simply said it was no problem, and that he had his clippers in his bag. I decided to just be real with the guy. Hey, listen, I just don't feel comfortable getting haircuts from people I don't know. Like, at night and stuff. You feel me? The guy never changed facial expressions for the entire interaction. He finally just said true that and continued to glare into my soul, basically. I decided in that moment it was about time to just get out of here. Luckily, the bus stop was right in front of our local Circle K, a gas station for those who aren't familiar. I walked in there for a few minutes just to kill time and get away from this guy. Unfortunately, the bus was not showing up for another 17. I didn't want to stay long, though. I didn't want the employees to think I was trying to steal or something. Granted, I had a pretty good reason to be inside at the time. I waited about six to seven minutes. Literally, as I'm walking out, I see the haircut guy walking in, staring into my soul once more. Luckily, I just walked past him and fled out of there to another bus stop down the street. The bus finally arrived. I saw the dude at the back of the bus, but he didn't try to bother me anymore. I made sure to keep my eyes the complete opposite of his direction the entire time. I tend to overthink most social situations I'm in, even if they're extremely quick. But how would you have handled that situation? Would you have let this guy cut your hair? A few years back, I rented an apartment from a friend of mine. He had recently bought it and had it completely renovated. He put it up for sale but couldn't find a buyer, so I offered to rent it in the meantime. After moving in, I quickly realized there was something wrong with the lady next door. She was around 45 but looked much older, and she would sit up all night listening to Christian radio shows and talking loudly to someone. It got to the point where I couldn't even sleep, so I went over to her place and asked her to keep it down, please. She opened her door, and I quickly got a peek at her walls. They all had crosses painted on them in different colors, and words like Jesus and angel scribbled everywhere. And the windows had been painted black, letting in no light at all. There were damp, yellow-stained, 50-year-old carpets with dog crap and cockroaches everywhere. No dog in sight, though. I asked her to keep it down once more. She gave me this crazy look and slammed the door shut in my face. She turned up the radio even louder. The next night, I had my girlfriend staying over. I woke up in the middle of the night to see a shadow of a person next to the bed looking down at us sleeping. I thought I was hallucinating, as I usually do in the dark when I'm sleepy, but then the shadow started talking. It was my neighbor. She was holding something in her hand. She'd broken in sometime during the night, and who knows how long she was standing there. She walked out soon after. 
The next morning, I could hear someone making strange noises below my bedroom window. It was my neighbor talking to herself in tongues again. At this point, I was beyond scared. She was obviously very ill. I went upstairs and knocked on another person's door and asked what the hell was going on. The guy was just as scared as I was. Apparently, she'd broken into his apartment one evening as well while he was watching television with his kids. He got up from the couch to get a snack, only to find her hiding behind the couch staring at him, holding a power drill in hand. Now I know what she was holding in her hand that night. At this stage, I was basically hysterical. I called the cops and they knew all about her. Apparently, she was a violent schizo and hadn't taken her meds in quite some time. They couldn't force her to or enter her apartment without her permission because she owned it. The only thing they could do was get her when she went outside. I sat up for the next two weeks, waiting for her to run out of cigarettes. When I heard her leave at 2 a.m. to go across the road to 7-Eleven, I called the cops. They had three cars and a special van over in less than two minutes. They restrained her and tossed her in the van and drove her off to some special institution. It all happened in less than a minute. It's like she was never there. I never saw her again after. I still have nightmares about her looking down at me in my sleep. This happened to me when I was about eight years old, and it still scares me to this day. One evening, I went to let my dogs in from the back garden at around 9 p.m. or so. It was pitch black outside, so I quickly opened the door and my dogs came bounding in. As soon as they came inside and I'd locked the door, at that exact moment, a person on the other side stood up and pulled the handle down trying to get into my house. We had a glass door, so even in the dark I could make out the outline of the man standing there. I ran to my dad, and he ran into the back garden after the man. I saw him running down the road to chase him. Unfortunately, the man got away. Ever since then, I've always closed and locked all doors at the speed of light whenever I go outside or come back in. I don't want to risk another split-second action of someone possibly getting into my home ever again. One of the scariest things I've ever heard was when I worked in retail. The store I worked at used to do layaway, and that was where I worked, right by the layaway counter. We had three bathrooms, a men's multi-stall, a woman's multi-stall, and a family bathroom. Only the family bathroom had a door that locked. All the others had a push-pull swing door. I was in the back cleaning up when I thought I heard someone screaming. I walked out front by the counter and I heard more screaming. I was not sure at first what it was coming from. I ran and checked in the men's and the woman's bathroom, but they were both empty. I could still hear the crying and screaming though. It seemed it was coming from the family bathroom. I banged on the door, but the yelling, screaming, and crying kept going. I called for a manager because I had no way of getting inside since it was locked. This whole time, there was still screaming and crying. After several attempts of trying to open the door, we finally called 911. We had no idea what was going on inside, but clearly it was nothing good. This went on for about 15 minutes. At this point, though, it felt like forever. Then the sound suddenly stopped. No more crying. No more screaming. We banged on the door until the police came. When they finally did, they had to kick it in, since we couldn't find the key. As we all stood around and looked in, all we saw was blood all over the place. We were not sure what happened at first, but the police told us to back up. That's when they pulled out a lady completely soaked in blood. We all just stood there in shock. This woman was not moving, and we all thought she must be dead. They took the lady away. We all had to give statements. 
This story is not scary in a ghost sense, but for that to happen right behind the door and to not know what was going on, the utter helplessness of it all was very scary to me. To really get my story, you have to have an understanding of my third floor landing. There is a single set of stairs that lead up to it. Once on the landing, it's a T-shape, with an office on the left, my bedroom to the right, and straight ahead being a bathroom with a shower inside. One night at about 10pm or so, I was taking a shower before I went to sleep. The glass panels on my shower are that convex glass that blurs everything, so everything was blurred and unclear outside. As I was taking the shower, I glanced through the glass door to the rest of the bathroom, only to see a hand reach over to the light switch. All they did was hit the lights, that's it. No noises, no sudden attack, nothing. Whoever it was had simply turned off the lights, so there I am. I'd just seen someone's hand reach into the bathroom, and now I'm in my shower in the pitch black. I'd never been so chilled to the bone before. Something about being in the darkness of night, with only the noise of water hitting the floor beneath you being around, it really reduced me to my most primal state of pure fear. I never felt like that before or since. I eventually somehow convinced myself to leave the safety of the shower and hit the lights back on. The relief that came over me was immense. I've never been able to explain it though. The stairs up to the landing are old and they creak like hell. Surely I would have heard someone coming and going up and down. But I didn't and there was no one there. No one was in my room or the office. What was even more weird was that nothing like it has ever happened since. Whoever had done it didn't seem to have done anything except turn off the lights. Let me start by saying that I was really only looking to hook up. I had just been dumped by my boyfriend, and I'm not the bar type. I figured that an online dating service would be a more reasonable option. I used a local personal service and have been talking to this guy for about two days before agreeing to meet up with him. His name was Mike and he told me that he used online dating because he was suffering from depression and was on a medication that made it hard for him to perform. He decided it was easier to meet women this way so they could know beforehand than to meet up in person and have to explain when they started getting physical. He went on to tell me though that he had a good feeling about me and that I was exciting to him despite his medication. Okay, seemed cool enough. I decided to go over to his place to see if we really did have any chemistry. We both seemed to be looking for the same thing, a hookup. When I got there, he was waiting for me in the living room. We started making out and I could tell he was getting a little aroused, but was having some issues. When he said that he knew what would help and that it was in his bedroom, I willingly followed. Walking in, I couldn't help but notice his bed being surrounded by cat condos. Lots and lots of them, some structured to be as tall as I was. I knew that he had cats but I assumed he'd meant one or two and that they were just hiding when I came over. Nope, he had ten, which all came out from underneath the bed. When we sat on it, they all rushed out and went to their perches on the cat condos to watch us after rubbing against him. He then went on to start making out with me again and was massively aroused. At this point, I was massively creeped out though. I like cats and I have some myself but having them watch me pee freaks me out. Much less them watching me be intimate with someone. I excused myself, openly admitting this was a little bit too strange for me. I left and he followed me, begging me to give him another chance and help him. I left anyway. For the next few days, he continued to message me, asking me to come over and saying he'd made some real progress with me. 
I blocked him after receiving a photo of him nude on the bed surrounded by the cats. I am the oldest of three kids. I have a younger sister who was eight at the time of this incident, and a brother who was six, while I myself was twelve. For years, we lived in a relatively rural area. We weren't too far from a bigger city, but we couldn't see our nearest neighbors from our house. We had plenty of space to play in. Back then, those were happy times. My dad worked from home for one of the countless companies that started up during the big dot-com boom in the 90s and made a good bit of money. That all ended with the crash in the early 2000s. My father lost his job, so we were forced to sell the house and move to a less expensive place in the city. Well, he looked for more work. The house must have been glamorous in its day. There was three stories and it was very spacious, even containing two staircases leading upstairs, a main one in the front and a smaller one in the kitchen. Sadly, the house had not been kept up with and was not in good shape anymore. It was also not in a good neighborhood either. It wasn't exactly a ghetto or anything, but it was definitely run down and shady. That's how we managed to get it for a price we could still afford. I remember being excited at the time, because even as a little girl, I was always interested in ghosts and monsters, and it seemed like we were moving into a haunted house. I wish this was just a ghost story, but sadly, as they say, the living are far more terrifying than the dead. During this time, my dad changed from the loving father he had always been to someone completely different, someone we were all very much afraid of. He struggled to find any stable work and began drinking as well. That would often make him very violent and abusive. Most of the time, it was over money. He could drink away every last cent. But how dare my mother buy food or an occasional toy for us? His rage was usually directed at my mom. But if any of us kids dared to draw his attention during one of his rampages, he was always more than willing to turn on us and share the love. As the eldest, I was very protective of my younger siblings. I would usually round them up and quietly head across the street to a small park whenever my dad would start. In that way, we were safer. If we didn't make him angry, he would leave us alone. Usually, we'd head back around dark, and he would be in bed passed out by then. One night, however, he was in a particularly foul mood. The yelling was worse than ever. I could even hear him from the playground all the way across the street. When darkness rolled around several hours later, we finally headed home. I could still hear him yelling at my mom from the inside. Then I heard my mother screaming in pain and fear, and the sound of glass breaking. I knew that something was wrong. I knew this was worse than usual. I told my brother and sister to go to the neighbors and get help, but my sister was terrified and wouldn't leave my side. My six-year-old brother ran next door alone, while we cautiously approached the house. When we got inside, we saw our mom was lying in the middle of the living room floor, bleeding. The furniture in the room was overturned, and the glass coffee table was shattered all over the floor. When she saw us, a look of terror came into her eyes. She gasped to run, but it was already too late. My dad heard us coming in, and had hidden behind the front door, which he slammed shut and stepped in front of. In his hand was a large kitchen knife, soaked in my mother's blood. His eyes were filled with rage. We did the only thing we could do, and ran into the kitchen for the back door. He was fast enough to cut us off before we could get outside. He flipped over the kitchen table in front of the door and screamed, Where do you think you're going? We scrambled up the back staircase, and I slammed the door separating it from the kitchen and locked it. We were far from safe. There was nowhere for us to go but upstairs. My father beat on the door for several seconds, then stormed off toward the main staircase. I quietly opened the door and pulled my sister toward the basement instead of going upstairs. We had a playroom and a small living room. I slid the love seat up from the wall enough so my sister could get behind it and lay down. 
I then pushed it back as close to the wall as I could without crushing her. I did the same for myself with the couch. We laid there in terror for what felt like hours. I could hear my father shaking the house with his rage upstairs, looking all around for us. It sounded like he was flipping furniture and breaking down doors. He eventually figured out we weren't up there and did the same thing on the ground floor. I heard him coming down to the basement and cried silently in terror. Just as I could see his feet step off the final stair, there was a crash upstairs and loud footsteps rushing into the home. My dad retreated into the dark corner of the basement until eventually the police worked their way downstairs and arrested him. Even after they took him away, I was still too scared to move. They eventually found us and took us upstairs, where my mother was being loaded into an ambulance. Thankfully, she survived, although I believe he would have killed her if we hadn't come home at that exact moment. We've never seen my father since. He wrote from prison a few times, but my mom never let us read the letters. All she did was tell us he said he was sorry, but that's all she would say. We never went to visit him and moved across the country shortly after. He's still locked up as far as I know. As you can imagine, the entire family spent years in counseling after that night. My younger sister has attempted suicide twice, and I still have nightmares and trust issues to this day. I don't think any of us will ever completely get over it. I'm 24 now, and I still live with the effects of that one night to this day. When someone who was supposed to protect you and care for you turns into the one you should be afraid of, it's really traumatic. You never fully get over that, and you never truly trust anyone again.